Hello, my BMX nerd friends. Welcome back to another episode of Canode Knows, brought to you by Dig BMX. This week we have somebody who I looked, I've looked up to for a long time. He's always felt like, I don't know, that's fucking Christian Regalis, dude. He's too cool. I, you know, I always uh, admired him and sweated him. I've made fun of him sometimes with his red and his his running gimbal, but he really uh, changed the game a lot when it comes to like. Uh, iTunes selling videos on iTunes the market video was phenomenal his history in BMX is amazing and filmmaking and then stepping up his game we get into how he uh, got into owning a red camera and then bringing that into BMX I think he was one of the first people shooting BMX on a red and uh, he's made a nice living for himself. He's got three different careers, started in riding BMX, then filming, and now he's a uh, professional mountain bike rider. And it's a, it was a cool conversation. I'm really glad that he came on. So I hope you enjoy this episode. Um, before we get into it, make sure you uh, like and subscribe, share the show with a friend, and leave a if you're listening, leave a five-star review on uh, Apple Podcasts. That would uh, help the show tremendously. So... Another thing before we get into it, go to rarlife.com and enter promo code CANODE to get 15% off of uh, green superfoods. It, it's something you can add into your daily routine that if you're not living the healthiest life right now, like start adding in the good stuff. You don't have to cut back on all the bad stuff yet, but if you add good, you'll start to feel better and then you'll think, okay, maybe I'll uh, stop drinking for a while or whatever the hell your problem is. Uh, that's that's a good enough intro. Uh, shout out to Dig. Shout out to Christian. Thank you for coming on. And I hope you guys enjoy this episode. And we'll see you next. Here's Christian Regal. Good morning, Christian Regal. Is that good how you morning, say it? Good morning, Bobby. Thank you for having me, dude. Fuck yeah. Stoked that you're down to do it. Everybody oh, yeah. that does this, I'm like, you're down? That's crazy. Dude, if people want to have a chat and anything that i can talk about can help or motivate or inspire anybody else i am always more than happy to do it hell yeah um yeah on that note have you uh i'm, I'm sure you've had you've been on tours and you know signed autographs and all that shit what's like your uh have you ever had you know a kid come up to you and be like man you're my hero or what sticks out do you have a memory i because for example, I was on a Sabrosa tour and then I still never forget this little kid came up to me and I don't think he knew who I was, but he was like, handed me a Sharpie. He was like, will you sign my forehead? And I got to sign this kid's forehead and like BK. And I was like, that's, I'll never forget that. Do you have a like little kid interaction or fan interaction that you have over the years that pops to mind? Um, I mean, there's definitely been a lot of like very surprising instances, but I can't help but think of a time that we did a United trip to Argentina and that was hands down the most diehard fans I've ever seen in my life. Like they would drive, one of the people drove 30 hours. Holy just, shit. Like, stand in line to walk into the shop to like have like a minute of time to like get a photo, get an autograph. Not even a, a minute might be gracious, you know, like it was so jam packed. And like just those fans, like they treated us like we were A-list celebrities. And That's in amazing. BMX, like, I've never felt anything like that. Like we had like people escorting us in and out of the demos. Like we had security, like it was, it was gnarly. And I just got like the slightest taste of what it would be like to be a real celebrity. And I was like, dude, happy to just be a BMX rider. <laughs> that, that shit is crazy. But just to see how, how passionate they were and how happy they were just to like meet, like, Nathan, Corey, Jeff, and and myself, like it was it was a trip, man. So definitely out there. Like if you ever have a chance to, uh, it might be all of um, like Central America, but like at least um, you know Argentina was insane. Like that's fire. I the love kid that. had Nathan's exact tattoo on his arm, like the same way Nathan had it, and I'm just like that's wow. That's some yeah. dedication right there. Super fans. Yeah, yeah. it's it's weird because we we stay in our own little like world here in the states, or even in just like your own city. And then if you think about it, like BMX is worldwide, and the fact that you got to travel and see it, like Argentina, dude, that's fire. How yeah. I, I was listening to uh, a Two Bears One Cave, and Tom Segura was talking about Argentina yesterday and he said it's like a 10 hour flight it's a long long ways away right am i right yeah i mean i, I think i said central america by accident but south america is more is where it is but yeah, yeah it's, uh, it's out there but like yeah man, it's it's beautiful out there the food the culture the riding like i i highly recommend it we did a big road trip all over argentina and 
I thoroughly enjoyed every everywhere that we went from the street spots to the the skate parks, the cool little shops that we saw. Like, that's yeah, tough. a lot of a lot of beauty to see out there and a lot of culture to experience. Yeah, and I don't know. That's amazing to hear that they treat you like a a list celebrity. That's that's kind of trippy. It, it's yeah. even trippy just being like a little celebrity at a bike shop in somewhere in the states, you know, and having kids come up and like, oh my god, that's you, you know, like. Oh, for happy. sure. I saw a kid, like not yeah. related to me, but I was filming a Haro tour and I was in the car, like pretty much hiding while the boys went out and got like same kind of treatment, just swarmed. And I watched a kid lick Chad Curley's head tube and had his homie like film it for him. <laughs> I'm just like sitting in the car like, oh my God, this is actually happening. Like his bike's on the rack in front of me and this kid's literally licking his head tube. Holy and, shit. Like, <laughs> this is insane. But it all that kid will never forget that either. He's like, I licked Chad Curley's bike. <laughs> yeah, dude. That's cool. Whatever, you know. Yeah. <laughs> to each his own. But it was just cool to see the the genuine like happiness that they got from from me. Yeah. Like you guys that, are so. like heroes. I mean, and honestly, the looking at looking back at the market video, market zero, like that shit was top of the top of the world type writing. Um, so two questions, like we could go in two different directions because we're on the being in Argentina. So that makes me want to ask, what's your favorite place you've been? I feel like you've been damn near all over the world. And then uh, the other route I would go is like, how'd you meet Chad Curley? Um, so let's try and do both. Like, what's your favorite place you've ever been? And then we'll get into meeting the boys. Hmm, that's a tough one. It's like, it's hard to say because I'm like, I'm like going off of experiences could be one thing going off like the setups that I found could be another thing. But I mean, honestly, like it might be cliche, but it's really hard to not say Barcelona when I mm -hmm. think back to like my at least BMX wise, when I think back to like the places I've been like, you just can't beat the like pedaling around and like literally it's like you're time traveling through videos, seeing these famous spots that you you remember, oh, there's that spot from this video and there's you know, this guy's spot from the fit video. And like, it's just, just that mixed with the amazing spots and then the culture out there and how laid back it is. The food's amazing. Like just everything together. Like anyone who's ever been to Barcelona, I'm, I can almost guarantee they either went back or they wanted to go back. And that's because yeah. it's such a unique place. So I'd, I'd probably put Barcelona quite high on that list of overall from the spots to the experience to everything is definitely a, a highly recommended travel destination for anybody that rides bmx or, or skateboards yeah dude it's paradise it's like a walk it's like walking through a video game literally and then you know the beach is right there it was i was tripped out by like how laid back it was in the afternoon like the siesta is a real thing and just like you said the culture of being able to instead of like driving to a supermarket you just walk to a like real local market where they have fresh fruit and vegetables and all that. And it's, it's a totally different world over there. The way they yeah. live in Europe is interesting and uh, it's quite contrary to how we got it here in the States, you know? For sure. I think it's a refreshing change of, of pace and scenery out there. Yeah. All right. What's I'm curious because you have been everywhere. So what's a close second? Um, I don't, that's a tough one. Like, because I've been to some really amazing places as just a filmer and it was really awesome, but it's hard to pick out like between that and, and riding. I think Japan was probably just for me, like a very different experience and like a place that I never imagined I would have ended up on any of my normal travels, you know? Yeah. And like always a bit of a bummer in the sense to go to a place like that where the language barrier is so strong where like I didn't really get to connect with anyone on that kind of level but just like i mean the cities were so clean and so beautiful and the spots were insane and like just the yeah like that was just a really cool trip just being in a place where i never thought my my bike would take me and yeah yeah just so very, jealous very i want to go to japan dude, <laughs> dude it's, it's really cool like and we did a, a bike shop tour and somehow like i don't know if this is ian morris is doing or what but like we like prioritized our filming and riding. So like we did shop stops, but like at night, <laughs> so we like go ride all day and like hit a bunch of six spots and get a bunch of clips and then go meet up at a shop or like a, a skate park at night and like hang with the kids and stuff. So it's like a pretty cool little balance where like, cause it's always a tease when you're in a really dope place and you're like, ah, like I want to go stop ride at a bike shop. Yeah. So, like, 
we definitely got to like make the most of it and ride some really great stuff and then also like connect with the locals and go to all the shops so i'd say dude japan i think that's smart that's a smart way to do it do the bike shop or the shop stop at night and so that you have a day to ride in that city that's fire yeah exactly what brought so, you to uh japan you said it's camera related what were what project were you doing that one was a riding trip actually that was like um i think it's maybe motocross or something was the distribution i don't remember the distro out there exactly but i think between them and united they they came together and, and got us out there and um yeah it was just like a kind of came out of nowhere um but yeah it's just a distro trip just uh we made a cool little video from it and yeah i just think it was like a kill two birds with one stone we'll do all these shop stops stoke everyone out all the distros that are selling our bikes and then make a cool little video and share it with everybody else so that's the move. That's kind of the whole point. It's interesting, like, I don't know, trying to think about BMX and what we are, you know, like basically a professional rider is just a billboard, you know, it's, it's all marketing the product to sell and thinking about it from the business aspect of it and how valuable it is to go to a shop stop because then you're impacting those kids and they, you know, they'll buy something because they got to meet you with their, you know, they want, they want Christian Miguel's frame or whatever. It's, it's interesting to think about like could you see yourself owning a bmx company would you ever want to do that <clears throat> i've been there's been multiple times over the years where i wanted to start my own brand just because i mean i think it's just a natural progression like you ride for companies then also as a filmer i work with companies so between the two i feel like i have a very good idea of like what you know how things should be done and and all that from my previous experiences so i at one point, like I almost launched a hat company back in the day before there was really like any proper like hats. Um, I've always got ideas, but it takes a lot of a uh, lot of execution work, dedication, is hard, yeah. energy and, and money to follow through on these. But just from the time, the years that we had market, like I would love to have something like that where it's like your own baby, even if it's that started from like a crew and some stickers, you know, and it turned into something like very legit. So just knowing how that grew and how that started pretty organically um I, I would love to have that someday but at this point in my life right now i'm like there's no way i could have the bandwidth to do something like that yeah but, um i don't i don't see myself ever having a normal job or working like a nine to five or anything so if i'm not riding for a living and if i'm not filming for a living then i'd be an entrepreneur and i'd have my own company or, or something going on because i hell just, yeah that's how I am. And I'm, I'm not good with working under like a stereotypical, like boss in a, a normal job atmosphere. <laughs> it's a nightmare, dude. I've had a couple of, uh, different corporate jobs and I never last long. Dude, I sold, um, I was, I was fresh out of college. I got a job as a copier salesman, like, you know, the big copy machines that you see yeah. in businesses, dude. And I would have to, I, I got my dad's old suits and his old like fat ties and his pleated large pants. And I just looked <laughs> ridiculous, like 21 years old and trying to, it was a uh, business to business. So I'm just walking into these random businesses, like, hi, would you like to speak about your copy machine? And they're like, no, dude. And I was like, yeah, fuck this dude. I don't like, <laughs> I can't handle it. The, just yeah. like the structure dude i want to be able to like because like i don't know i think there's it's so dumb to be locked in from this time to this time like if you can get the work done you should be able to bounce you know and totally like, like disincentivizes being efficient um anyway i i remember market had some genes going on at a certain point right is that yeah that was kind of like the whole goal from the start was like all right we're gonna start it as a crew but it's gonna turn into like you know, me and Dennis and, and most of us were riding like Volcom jeans at the time and like paying like, you know, 70 or 80 bucks for jeans that we were stoked on. And, and all that money is just going into skateboarding's pocket. And like, yeah. we were just like, fuck, like Dennis took the initiative to like, you know, create samples and, and base this crew and turn it into a brand. And it sucks because like, I feel like we did all the right things, but the timing was off on a lot of it because it took so long to like sample the jeans and, figure out the manufacturing and everything. So by the time we were done with the video and it was out, like we kind of, I feel like we kind of missed our, our window for, for with the jeans, so by off, the time we yeah. had the jeans perfected, we lost the material, like the manufacturer we're using discontinued the material. And it kind of just like, it just Damn. really like it all fell apart from there. Like we ordered one or two more batches of jeans that were supposedly with the same material and it wasn't. And then they started to rip and it just like, 
it kind of just like that was like the straw that broke the camel's back and i think like it was already enough of a process to get to that point where like we've tested the genes we can co-sign for these like they're the best and then they pulled the rug out from under us and and kind of screwed Damn. that so either way i think like for what i think we accomplished way more than we ever would have imagined and most of the work that Dennis did on that was while he was hurt. He unfortunately had a lot of injuries during that time. So I think like it made sense and he had the time available to like pour into the brand, into the the manufacturing side of it. But then by the time all the problems happened and Dennis is healthy again, I just think like it just seemed like a little too much to devote that much time and energy into something when we pretty much have to start from scratch again so yeah it was it was a denim company for for a bit and i mean i still have people to this day a lot of mountain bikers were really hyped on the jeans and i like brandon seminick was like probably one of the most like he probably bought more pairs of those jeans than any into other like individuals so it's cool to see like that it grew outside of bmx and people did like really think that they were the best jeans so i'm glad that we it was short and it was sweet, but uh, I'm glad it that had an impact. We made something that that we were happy with that that other people were also into. So I think That's short, dope. short and sweet, but we did it. We did it right as far as we could for being a bunch of young dudes that knew nothing of running a business or or anything of that. Yeah. Form. It's cool to it's cool to at least try. And that's Dennis seems like he's just like let's go. You know, he does does shit, and then then he gets you know, life gets busy and. You know, I'm I'm stoked on uh, stoked on anybody doing shit or at least trying. You know, that sucks. All the stuff happened with the jeans. Um, I remember market like it was yesterday, dude. I think if correct me if I'm wrong, but I think mediocre at best. My video was nominated the same year as market, and then you guys won. And am I right? Is that the same year? Do you remember? Because I'm pretty sure that was where we met. Was the the toast where it because the the t first toast it premiered. And then the second toast, I think, was the Nora where it won. Yeah. And I would say that between one or two of those is when when we met. But yeah, I'm pretty sure those were falling under the same year. Like if you guys were the same year as the fit video or Van Homan won video part, then that was the same year that we won video of the year. Nice. Yeah. Well, congrats. I see that trophy. It's a beautiful thing, man. <clears throat> Thank you, man. It's a it's absolute honor. Like I'm very happy to have that like souvenir for what i would consider the most like memorable and special time of my my bmx career is those market days so yeah that's it's a timeless video dude it's kind of crazy to look back and i just just skim through it and i'm just like the writing in this is like unbelievable and it's the type of writing that doesn't matter how much time goes by it's still gonna be a fucking banger it's a it's a pretty uh legendary video oh thank you i, <clears throat> I often joke that for everybody that I mean, Dennis and, and Chad aside, everybody else in markets pretty much like switched careers or, or moved on to just like having a family or whatever. And I feel like we caught the best of each of our riding in that video. I think like yeah. me and Jeff put out one more video part for United after that. I'm still very proud of that, but I feel like most of us kind of like slowed down and, and changed, uh, changed things up after markets. So I'm glad that we like captured that moment of time and you know did it to the best of our abilities because after that everyone's lives kind of changed and obviously Dennis and Chad are still very much doing their thing and killing it in BMX but like me Jonas Rob Jeff Connor Ronnie we got like life changed um so how has life changed for you what what does life look like for you right now shoot it's it's still a trip to even think about, but I'm pretty much just riding mountain bikes full time for a living and filming. I don't even, it's, we're four months into the year. I haven't even pitched one project as a filmer. So nice. I've never, never been just a rider. I've been riding bikes as a sponsored bike rider for I think 16 years. And I've never, ever just been a rider. I've always like juggled and, and bounced between riding and filming. So yeah. Yeah, I'm just like riding, trying to put all all my effort into my own projects and and spending as much time on the bike as I can. And um, I'm not going to shy away from a cool video project as a filmer if it pops up. But I'm not like seeking the work like I used to, and I'm not like taking every job that comes like I used to. And 
yeah, just, I don't know how long this chapter of my life will, will be around to be able to like ride for a living. So I'm putting my all into it and as you should, dude, that's trying to make so it last as long as I can. This is a, a dream come true that I never even would have been able to dream. So I'm like, I'm going to cherish it and, and make the most of it. Hi, I've seen, cause it's, I don't know if it's like a trend, but a lot of people are switching from BMX or not switching, but like adding mountain biking into their world. How did it come about for you? Have you always like fucked around with mountain biking on the side or did you like make a conscious decision? All right, I'm going to, I want to get into this. Like how did uh mountain biking into your life? A really, it was really random and an organic process. Um, it all just started from Dennis was the first one to ever like, put me on to um Brandon Semenek and his he's been dropping mind-blowing videos since he's so sick dude I mean I think like I think right around the market video they did Revel in the Chaos which was like I remember him saying he was inspired by the market video because we did it on iTunes we kind of did it all our own self-funded and everything so right around that same time he took inspiration from that so Dennis knew of him just from Instagram like dude there's this insane like Red Bull mountain biker like you got to check out his videos and instantly became a fan like i could just tell the way he rode the way his videos were produced like the, the the tracks that he builds and the jumps he builds like there's just something about it that like drew me in so i was a fan of of him and mountain biking but like through him like i didn't know anyone else i didn't like follow or know anything else about it and um i think i like went to follow him one day and he's already following me and nice. we just kind of like you know I feel like, I don't know, for me, it's normal to just end up like chatting with, with people on Instagram, just whether it's from through comments or whatever, but we became friends. We, we met at a skate park through Heath Pinter and legend just, just kind of randomly bumped into each other a few times over the years. And then, um, one day we were on a street trip, me, Dennis and Nathan Williams filming up in NorCal and Brandon comes to Aptos where I live now every winter to escape the snow. And he's like, hey, if you dudes ever want to come ride mountain bikes, let me know. I got some spare bikes. And I was like, you know, I'd ask the boys. I'm like, yo, you guys want to go ride mountain bikes with Brandon Semenek? And they're like, oh, yeah. <laughs> Fuck like, yeah. We were, but we were pretty roached. Like, I already had a rolled ankle. Dennis and Nathan both, I think Dennis had a bad wrist and Nathan had a tweaked ankle or something. We were like, end of the film trip. Like, I was still like trying to get clips too. So we were all like feeling it and we're like, fuck, like mountain bikes might be kind of gnarly, but like they have suspension, maybe it won't be that bad. And um, yeah, like long story short, we we met up with Brandon, they took us to a private property, which strangely enough, I just moved across the street from. So like full circle, now I live across the street from where it all he started. started mountain but, biking. Wow. Um, he handed us two of his like brand new, freshly painted custom ramp Red Bull Rampage bikes, like the bike he like rode and then his like backup bike and like we had no clue of the the significance of of these bikes or how damn crazy that was yeah the time. no helmets no clue what we're doing just like following him down the trail trying to survive like i'm like <laughs> trying you know, to survive anything. nathan's like sliding out in the turns like it was we felt like little kids like it was like the only thing i could compare that feeling to is like the first day i ever went to woodward in middle school as a camper and it's just like sensory overload having yeah. so much fun we're like laughing and giggling down the trail like little kids like it was the most fun i could really remember having on a bike and i told brandon the end of that day i'm like dude next paycheck i get or i can justify like i'm buying a mountain bike like fuck yeah what was the first one that you bought uh brandon actually got me a, an industry deal on a trek remedy and i had that bike for like a year um before i like changed it up and and everything but yeah like that literally that day changed it all for me and just like that was what got me hooked like I didn't have any aspirations of like making anything with mountain biking or doing anything with mountain biking I was just like I just loved the, like the feeling I got from it and at that time it pretty much been almost a year of me like kind of clocking out of BMX and like I'm like okay like I'm just gonna see what like being a filmer is like I've never just been a filmer I know that my work can be better if I put all my effort and time into it. So I kind of had about a year of just filming and I definitely noticed my, I was more proud of my work in that year. Cause when I'm not thinking about riding or going to a spot to film a dude and then like going back and forth of like getting some riding in myself and filming him, like you miss those opportunities of all the, the sick B roll and all the like test, you know, shots and everything. So um, yeah, I was like a filmer for a year, but it wasn't like, 
doing it for me. You know, like I still, like, I wasn't trying to push myself like I was on my BMX, but like, I still needed to like do something, you know, like I, I, I think I didn't have the drive to one up myself on BMX. And if I wasn't going to do something better than my last part, I wasn't interested in, in like trying to do another video part. Yeah. Um, but I didn't find or have anything else in life that I could like physically and mentally like push myself and like scare myself and, and get the adrenaline going. Cause like, I was just jibbing around on my BMX bike. So I wasn't like getting my fix, I guess. So right, I'm yeah. very glad and happy that I found mountain biking because I need that in my life. Like I, I'm not content with just filming and like documenting people do scary, crazy shit. Like I like to do that stuff. I need to like, I don't know, like I, I think the term's so corny, but like, I literally am like an adrenaline junkie in the sense of like, I need like I, I'm chasing that that yeah. feeling all the time, and and I didn't really know that like I needed it until I didn't have it anymore. And I'm like, cool, like I'm not gonna go start diving down forty stair rails again. But like, I'm glad that I I genuinely or naturally just found something where I could pour that and push uh, yourself out and, of me into it. Yeah, and keep getting better. And that's what you touched on is like kind of it's wise you know well i don't know everybody has their different opinions but i i'm with you on like if you're not gonna like try and do something better than what you last did it, it doesn't feel the same you know totally. it's interesting that you say you're an adrenaline junkie because that definitely shows in your writing your shit is wild and crazy setups big ass rails like why and i'm curious about that mindset with various riders and where it comes from if you could like as a therapist why do you think that you're so attracted to that type of shit you know why why are you an adrenaline junkie where does that come from do you think i'm not sure where it comes from but i think that it's just the feeling like it's i mean honestly it's like a drug like it's like that's why i'm like addicted to it because like riding will always like make me happy but it's like i need to like push it a step further to like really dig into like the I don't know, like what gets me going. And it's like, it's not just the riding. It's like pushing myself and like tricking my brain into doing the things that it's telling me I can't do when I know that I can do them, you know? And I think yeah. I just like that, like personal mental battle of like, I'm not competing against anybody else. Like I've never like, I'm the most competitive person to me, but I don't care about like competing in the sense of like what other people are doing or anything like that. So like, I think I just always have that personal like battle with myself where I'm like, I want to get better. I want to do this. Like, I don't think I can do that, but I really want to, you know, it's just like, I don't know. I think I just crave that, like, like proving to myself and showing that I can do it. And then the feeling you get after, like, I mean, if I could do like an amazing click turn down and get that feeling, then I'd be hyped. But that was never the reality for me. It's more like I need to like, send this massive rail and then the feeling i get when i roll away from it is going to be the sickest feeling ever like i for real yeah I, it took me a lot to to uh, to get the feelings that i was after versus like i'm sure some other riders can just like flow a bowl and just like front to yeah. back tire on the coping every time and just like that could probably do it for them but like as far as like style tricks or style and all that goes like i never felt that my riding brought me that kind of feeling so i think like i just naturally discovered that doing scary shit was what ticked all the boxes for me and hell yeah i just kind of gravitated toward that and, and ran with it what's the uh what's the scariest clip that you can think of the speaking of you know mental battles and not thinking that you can do it what's the one that sticks out in your mind of like fuck i did i really didn't think i could do that one um i mean there's You've done, you've done so much dude. yeah crazy. there's a couple for different reasons because some of them just scared me like because for dumb reasons but like overall probably i'd have to say is the banger in my united video where i did the grind to gap over the loading dock yeah the rail because i was like so convinced that i could do it but then the times where I'd get on the rail weird, I was like, dude, if I went for it right now, like I'm going to sprocket case the fucking rail. Like I was just so scared. And I literally remember like Mira had just passed away like that week or something. And I like, Damn. before I went on this one, I was like, fuck it. Like this one's for Mira. And I just like went for it. And I swear like that helped. Cause like there's the times where like, if I tell myself I'm going for it, 
I'm going for it. And I might bitch out one time, but really like the second that I like say I'm doing it, I'm fucking doing it. And I didn't do it on that one. And I was like, dude, if I don't do it on this next one, it's like, I know I'll be like broken record mode and it won't happen. Yeah. So, Cause I, I went the day before and I couldn't get myself to do it. So I think like, just, you know, thinking of him and just like putting that mindset for me, like made it work. But I think that was probably like overall just like the most scary and the, the the deepest I had to dig to like get myself to commit to something, even though I knew like I'm going fast enough, like it's going to work. But like if I tried five feelers, like two of them would be death. And like I had to just rely on like, I think my chance sand. Higher of, of making it than not making it. But yeah, dude, that's, that's a big. hell of a clip. And then I, I remember seeing the, like the stoke afterward is like very real. And I, not everybody goes through life. Some people go through life and they never experience that type of high, you know, like that, like accomplishment. And I, there's definitely something addicting about that. What For going, sure. going back in time, what was your first kind of taste of this type of shit? Like, how did you even get into writing? I, that's a cliche podcast question, but give me the, uh, give give me the you, breakdown of, you know, your story. Yeah quick generalization uh, i grew up in a small town and for some reason there was a lot of kids that rode bmx there and i just would see this pack of riders pedaling from one side of town to the other the bank that i'd go to with my mom she'd go to the atm and like next to the bank there was a dirt lot with a couple little dirt jumps and like just seeing that combined with watching like x games on tv and all that stuff i just like i already rode bikes but not bmx bikes and i just like I just wanted to jump like I saw those dudes hitting jumps and getting air and like just their little squad pedaling around and yeah it didn't take long for me after I saw that and I think like maybe one of my friends from school had a BMX I'm just like mom like I want a BMX bike for Christmas or whatever so nice. yeah just seeing it around my town and then after seeing it starting to like go to the, the the video store and renting VHS tapes that had anything to do with like biking skating or rollerblading anything like I was just hyped on anything action related back then so oh do you remember yeah. what your first bike was the one My that you first got you real proper well i had like a couple of toys r us bikes like a, a royce union or something you know yeah, just nice. like sketchy like front back brakes four pegs just like nothing mm -hmm. that you could really shred but um the first real bike that i got at the bike shop was a mosh like i think just like a chromoly mosh bike like a cheaper one maybe like a uh it's probably like 250 bucks at the time were like the nicer ones like the gt performers and fuelers and stuff those were like 500 bucks so like yeah. it was like a proper bmx bike though and then um how after, old are you at this point do you think uh i GT got performer. that bike in third grade damn you started early nice yeah yeah um yeah i was like soccer basketball from like kindergarten first grade second grade into third grade and then like once i found bikes I just like kicked all that stuff to the side and just rode bikes. And yeah, that was it. For How me. were your parents with that? My parents were really, really supportive. Like I had some friends that their parents were much more stern on like them sticking with team sports. Yeah. Um, I think my parents saw the the passion and the enjoyment that I got from it. And th like, they're like, if you don't enjoy, I even like, bef I think even before I found BMX, I was the kid that just wanted to go to the games and not go to practice. Like I didn't, I was already like, I feel like phasing out of team sports. I didn't like having a coach. I didn't like dealing with the team. Like if I was playing good, I hated when I lost because the other, the, some other players like weren't playing good or whatever. Like I think I always just gravitated towards being on my own program and like, you know, being on my own team in the sense of like BMX is very like independent and like you pushing yourself and everything. There's not like a coach there telling you what to do or yeah practice or whatever so i think i i was already gravitating out of that and then i found bmx and then i just like solidified that this is more my scene and and what i like and yeah it was a wrap after that <laughs> what was uh the first couple of tricks that you learned the classics you know 180 jumping what i definitely remember it was really hard learning just yeah flat ground 180s flat ground 360 tire taps um, a lot of driveway riding on my street just trying to learn these tricks yeah. But I always like will forever remembering like the first uh or forever remember the first like real trick that I ever considered I like learned in the streets was a tree ride. 
like <laughs> a tree ride we had, nice like yeah like a, a burger king in our town and all the older guys would go and just do like you know tree ride to fakies on it and like i remember me and connor lotus like he grew up in the same town as me like we would go there like every day and just like bounce off this tree and just try and learn it and i remember like figuring like i learned how to tree ride before i learned how to feeble grind i don't even think nice. i had pegs back then but yeah um yeah that was like the first like real trick in the streets and pretty funny now like now i'm just driving around town looking for trees to ride on my mountain bike so like, <laughs> that's trippy that, that's where it all started again, and yeah. that's where i still like really enjoy and love to ride the most is when i find a really rad tree ride on, on yeah mountain. <laughs> it's a cool ass obstacle, dude. I I can I can relate. In my neighborhood, there was a tree that was kind of perfect. It was like a little mellow ramp, and same thing, like tree ride to fakie. I'm on. I remember I started at one point. I was riding a 24 inch front wheel, and then the back wheel went. Uh, you know, it just shit the bed, and I only had a 20 inch wheel, so I was rocking a 20 and a 24, riding around my neighborhood with a helmet on and doing tree rides to fakie and trying to 180 that bike and. We started the mullet trend before everyone. <laughs> the, the, <laughs> um, so then I guess after, you know, you're in the, that's so cool. I'm trying, I'm like visualizing you and Connor just being young kids. Cause we all are young kids, you know, if you picture it, you look at you guys when you're, you know, shining and your market video and you made it this far, like it's, it's easy to be like, oh, oh, they're up there, you know, but we're all just like little kids that like BMX bike. It's, it's such a trip. Dude, for sure. We were like the smallest of small town. Like, dude, the town I grew up in when I was a little kid, there was two red lights, like in the whole town. Like it was such a small town, but I don't know why. And like, strangely enough, I just found out uh, like a month ago, Connor sent me a link that his dad found on Facebook. There was like a BMX racetrack in our town in the seventies. Hmm. I'm like, I mean, maybe it's just a random thought that I'm correlating on my own, but I'm like, it's so weird that there was a sick BMX track in our town. And then when I grew up, there was like 20 or 25 kids that rode BMX, like between all ages from like me being in third grade to the older kids in eighth grade. And like, I don't know why, but like, maybe there's something, something in the fucking dirt out there or whatever. But like, there was a lot of BMX riding happening in what I would consider a very small town off the beaten path that nobody even fucking knows about. So, um, is this in, uh, is this this small town? Is this, this is in California? You yeah, it's, it's, called, it's called Moraga. It's, um, a little suburban town back in the Hills. Like you go over the Hill and you're like in Oakland and Berkeley. Um, but yeah, super small town area. Like there wasn't any skate parks back then. We were just building dirt jumps and riding bank to walls and, and trees, you know, sick. So Connor, Connor was your first, your first, uh, BMX homie that, you know, right. Basically sure. like the first, like proper, like I had a couple friends I rode around with, but like I met Connor at my middle school, I was riding off picnic tables and he was like riding around also. And his mom worked at the school. And I remember we we're just like, Oh, you want to ride? And like, we just rode around the school and just looked for shit to like ride our bikes off of and like jump Sick. stuff, whatever. Yep. And, like, and then I remember like looking up his number in the the phone book of like the La Mirinda, which is like the three towns in our area. So it gave us the numbers of like the kids in the other school. And I remember like cold calling him one day, like, <laughs> cold ride? calling like, him. <laughs> hey, Connor, it's Christian. I was wondering if you wanted to go ride bikes, dude. I was that kid that you were riding off picnic tables with. Like. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing how fun it was back then to just drop off of stuff. It's so exciting, you know, like. Dude. We didn't That's... have any references. Like I didn't have any videos back then or anything. So I didn't know even what you could do on a BMX bike. So yeah, shit just seemed pretty straightforward. <laughs> when, when did you get into seeing what was possible and like seeing videos and getting more inspired and starting to be like, Oh shit, I kind of want to do this. You know, I think it was, I mean, not too far in, like maybe like within like a year of riding. Um, I remember my local bike shop, I bought, made it primo made in taiwan which is on vhs like castillo taj wessel nate hansen like really like um what's his name um why am i fucking spacing bako um the group you know yeah. like it had every type of riding in that video and now i look back and i'm like fuck that was a great video to be my first one because like after that i wanted to build i built a flatland bike like i was trying everything once i saw what these Sick. dudes were doing and like yeah like Taj has been a huge inspiration since then so it's like that was my first video and then Etnies Forward was my second video I remember going to the bike shop and there was like a pre-order for it 
and like the shoes were just coming out and like that that era of like bmx is my favorite yeah. um but yeah between made in taiwan and etnies forward those were the videos that like really like showed me what pro riders were doing and then from that i became i started like watching x games and like following riders and like becoming a fan of everything but before that i was just like to me the the riders in my town were the pros like yeah they were like those are the dudes i idolized and looked up to because i didn't even know what was beyond that you know bmx to me was what i saw within my town and within those riders and then once i saw those videos i'm like holy shit like there's skate parks and contests and like these pros and like that was where it all changed for this sure the whole thing you know yeah. um what was your first trip outside of your small town with your bike um uh i definitely did a couple of san diego trips um one of the the local riders that i grew up riding with an older dude that i one of the guys i idolized like he moved to san diego and um i remember going down there to stay with him because i heard about the crazy claremont skate park and that was like those were like the MySpace days where like I knew about Dennis because of MySpace because he was this like 13 year old kid in San Diego that was like fucking killing it at the skate park. Yeah. Um, so I knew about the scene out there. I remember seeing like the Biketoberfest uh, contest videos and it's like Wong Tran, Chris Hervan, Steve Woodward, Dennis, like all these dudes. I'm like, these dudes live here and ride this park every day. Like I have to come down there and visit. Like at the time, like, um i don't think or i guess i think i might have been to woodward already so i i met a couple pros there but like in, in at home like i think i saw nyquist like brother one time at a skate park and i think i saw joey cobbs one time at a skate park but like i never really like brushed shoulders with any pros um and then when i went to san diego i'm like holy shit like you come to this skate park on any given day and you could just ride with these dudes yeah it's so um, wild it's cool yeah, you mentioned so. wong tran dude i love the old videos of wong dude he was ahead oh. of his time with all the nose males and his For style sure. is so dude, fucking wong sick. and tammy like there is like yeah. always like stephen hamilton and there were dudes like doing nose males before them but i swear those wong and tammy were the first dudes to like do it to distance like and that caleb kid um caleb, caleb Kwanbeck. yeah i remember but i remember like wong and tammy were were pushing a lot of tricks back then that no one was doing and that whole San Diego scene man very very unique uh dynamic over there of, of extremely talented and diverse riders that yeah. all collectively met at the skate park still those days aren't aren't around anymore we're like riders from all different walks of life would all meet at the park and like there was a strong scene there and then the session was done and we're all chilling in the parking lot drinking smoking hanging out for like hours you know like yeah definitely miss that that dynamic but um yeah those give are very d cool. i was just thinking yep. in my brain like what was the scene it was give d yeah. dude. shout yeah. out yeah. kyle we're and like long and all them. sponsored by like odyssey and like yeah, yeah cool it was going a, back it was then. cool ass crew and then yeah i think kyle was like chainless at that point um yep. let me yeah. I got to pause real quick. No worries. So, give D shout out to Kyle. I'm trying, I have this clip in my mind that I'm picturing. It was like one of the first nose mail to 180, and it's like on the island at, yep. I think, probably Claremont. Was it Wong or Tammy? Or probably both of them did it. I, I think it was Wong. Yeah, I think it was Wong. But yeah, a lot of, a lot of iconic historic shit happened back then. Yeah. On a daily so this, basis. <laughs> This kind of and so what kind of riding were you doing at that point when you're going to the skate park because you seem like you i don't know i from what i understand you were you know a park kid and you learned all the tricks and then eventually over time like a lot of pros do you kind of find your niche what what were you uh what were you like back then going to the skate totally. park with all them yeah so right before i moved to san diego i was working at woodward for a couple summers and i was definitely like gyro two pegs like 450 bar like bar to tuck like Sick. Um, did a cup did uh, did a few tail whips um but like yeah i was definitely more like transition but i always rode street like just from when i was a little kid um but yeah like i remember I think by the time I moved to San Diego, I was brakeless and I was riding like a fit Aiken S3. Damn, and, I haven't heard that frame in so long. That's such oh, a yeah. good one. Yeah, and classic. Like, full, like 
multiple different colors spray painted raw just like pieced together from like homies bikes like maybe mm -hmm. a couple parts from dennis's old bikes just like full like you know do what i can take what i can to make it work yeah um and then like yeah i think right when i moved down to san diego i stopped at volume and demolition and picked up my first package of demolition stuff and then yeah so once i got to san diego like brake list still doing park riding but like definitely getting more into street and then i started like i remember like learning lucky grinds and starting to like do more handrails and stuff like that like i was pegless for a long time i remember i did I come visit Dennis and I did a pegless handrail and I remember he was like tripping out on that. He's like, dude, um, you don't have pegs. <laughs> I was definitely like, I, I was like pegless guy forever, super heavily like Garrett Burns influenced, like front foot pedal grinds, back foot pedal grinds, switch Sick. regular, like everything, pedal 180, like pedal 270, like all about pedal grinds. Did you and ever then, get front pedal to hard 180? I didn't even know what a hard 180 was back then. <laughs> nice. It was only like easy 180 or like a uh, switch grind, regular 180s. Yeah. And then um, then I put pegs on and that's when I think my brakes came off like pretty quickly after I put brakes on. But I remember going to like a local ledge in town and I learned like feeble hard 180s. And then strangely enough, I did an ice hard 180 and this isn't like, fuck, like, 2006 or seven. that's early for ice hard and like honestly like there's probably somebody else that was doing it but like it wasn't a trick like that that anyone yeah was doing, but i don't know how i did it and i've only probably done three in my life you just, so that was just happened to do an ice it hard just, on a flat like that's i did a few problem. i learned feeble hard 180 and then i was like oh cool and then i tried it with the ice pick and then it just worked that's amazing yeah. I got like hooked on grinding and learn I learned lucky grinds and then just like yeah after that I was like full like street dog and then um I remember I rode for mankind for a while and I was still like pretty proper still riding ramps but definitely like leaning more into the street stuff and then um after that I quit and I got a volume frame and I was filming and riding a lot with Jason Ends and those dudes. And then from riding with Ends, I was like, I want four pegs. Like grinding's dope. I want to be able to do everything yeah. on the other side. And then pretty much from that time on, I think I rode that volume frame for, I don't know, maybe four or five months. And then, um, still crazy to me, uh, Corey Martinez messaged me on Twitter and asked me if I was riding for volume. And I was like, no, like they just hooked me up with a frame to ride, but I don't ride for them. And he's like, oh, like, would you ever want to ride for United? Oh, like, holy shit. Like, fuck. Holy yeah. shit. And yeah, then I, I got on United and pretty much straight on, like got to start like traveling with them and, and doing stuff. And I think within like a year, they, they started paying me. And, and that's kind of how my professional career in BMX started. It was, it was all from Corey messaging me on Twitter and, that's Get fucking awesome, United. dude. Yeah. <laughs> God, what an OG Corey is. So let's go over your like sponsor history. I know you kind of just did, but you mentioned earlier you picked up a volume package and a demolition package. What was first? Mankind, volume, demolition? Dem demolition was first. Um, I remember like before I moved down south, I was like emailing like I don't even I don't even think it was Molar. I think it was like maybe just the general S and M website, but I made like a sponsor me tape, like proper like this nice. is a back in the day shit. Like new nowadays kids are probably like sponsor me tape. Like what the fuck? Like back then, like you literally like had to make a video and like send the fucking C D or whatever it was. I was C D before me, it was probably a VHS tape, but like yeah. I you send the send the C D. Like I, I worked on a little video with this little kid that was from San Diego. Who was down to like film some stuff and like cut it together for me and i i don't know if i ever actually got that footage to the hands of s m but i really was trying to ride for s m back then but um i got it to brian castillo i think thanks to dennis and connor because connor actually was connor was the first one to have the volume and demolition hookup he okay he nice there, and then he got dennis on and then between both of them uh I think Brian saw my my little video I made and he started hooking me up. So Demolition was first and then I got on Mankind. Um, and then in the midst of both of those, uh, Losi started hooking me up with Nike 6.0. Damn. Sick. And then, yeah, from Mankind, yeah, it went into uh, United. And then I pretty much rode for United and Demolition. Um, Forever. And for a lot. Yeah, all the way until Nike was done. 
And then I got on Etnies and I rode for Etnies for like eight or nine years, I think. Okay. And then, yeah, I think demolition kind of dwindled away at like once Brian kind of left, Brian Castillo left the, the company and I obviously wasn't really riding and pushing myself like I, I used to be like that kind of went away. But um, even to this day, I still ride for United. I built up a, a terrible one barcode not too long ago. Yeah, the, like, the mid to, or the 2000s. What'd you call it? It's like a it's like a mid school yeah. hybrid. I, it's like I was a, geeking on that bike, dude. It was like bringing back so many memories. It's so sick. You. Tell us about it. Um, yeah, so I, you know, like pretty much just have my one street bike and my riding's changed a bit. I'm not bombing fucking handrails and grinding off roofs anymore. Yeah. Uh, so I just wanted to build a bike that felt better for, for park riding and for dirt jumping. I don't, dude, I used to be a dirt rider. I won't ride dirt on my BMX bike anymore because I'm brakeless and I'm fucking sketchy. Now I just ride my mountain bike on them. So I've been like missing that feeling and like skate parks are dope when they have the right fun little street jibs, but like, I want to ride the bulls. I want to ride everything, but my bike's never been set up good for it. So I said, fuck it. I'm going to build a new bike. That's good for that. I had a T1 barcode as a kid. I always sweated T1 and, and yeah. Raj and Joe rich. So I, like I got, I found a 2017 barcode and I wanted to build it with a perfect mix of like the old mid school nostalgic parts that I like had as a kid or always wanted, but I didn't want it to be a tank and I wanted it to ride proper. So, um, yeah, I built that up and strangely enough through like building that bike, I got addicted to mid-school bikes and collecting. And now I'm like a fucking diehard mid-school collector. Sick. I've got an obnoxious amount of frames and bikes that I'm collecting and building. And it yeah, all dude. when you posted one that bike. one, when you posted that one, I'm zooming in on my phone, like looking at like, oh my God, I remember. But was it, I think it was, you put power bites on it, the cranks. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's got power bites like McNeil bash guard sprocket, like the T1 so pegs, the ramp pegs, like all I I hit all the nostalgic feels with yeah. that. And so sick, dude. And I that was the it. goal. Cause I'm like, man, like I cherish and miss those mid-school days of BMX. Like mid-school is generally like 1992 to 2005 is like what they'd call mid-school. And like for me, like the videos I watch the most the riders that inspired me the most, like the, that's the, the time frame that I'm like most, uh, you know, nostalgic for. Yeah. Nostalgic to, and, yeah. and, and relates to me the most. So. Cause that's when uh, you're in your impressionable years. I feel like from, you know, like age 10 until 16 or 18, you're like, everything is so sick, whatever you're getting into. And yet I would, I remember scrolling through dance comp and just geeking out over bike parts, which I would never do now. Like I don't, I don't care about oh, yeah. you know, looking at, looking at new bike parts, but yeah, that's, I remember being so stoked on just the actual bike. Now I don't care. It's like a tool, you know, but For it's cool. Sure. You found that passion to like get into collecting them. How many, uh, have you built up at this point? Well, I haven't actually built any of them yet. I've like compiled, I've got all the parts, I've gotten frames painted, I got new decals, like I have them all ready to build, but I've been waiting. I just moved into a new house. So I'm gonna start that, but uh, all my friends are gonna make fun of me because I told them when I started, I'm like, I'm only building five bikes, like the five like special bikes that I had as a kid or I always wanted. And now it's spiraled a bit, um, <laughs> but Spiral. uh, it'll probably be like 10 bikes that I build that are like, you know, super special. Like I either had one as a kid and I've re I've repainted and decaled and built it exactly how I had it. Or it's the bike that like my homie had that I never got or something like that. So yeah. I'm just like, it's fun, man. I love it. Like I, I'm hunting around online trying to find all these parts and the right stickers and like networking with all these people and connecting with old BMX homies that maybe we haven't really like talked much about, but like now we're like chatting again and i'm buying old bikes off of them or whatever it's it's been fun man i've i love bmx so much and it's cool to tap into this whole other side of like it's just not being like a collector side you know it's like just a bunch of other people that are really passionate about this but like yeah they're not like sponsored like some of them are you know there's it's cool to come across some names of dudes that like we're you know super legendary and now they're like like shad johnson obviously like big, big yeah time yeah and all that but it's like you know, a lot of these dudes are just like about BMX because they love it and they weren't like sponsored riders or pro riders, but it's cool to like it. connect with all these different sides of, of BMX now that I've been kind of in all of them, you know, like yeah. over the years. 
Is it a is there a white whale of yours that there's a part or a frame or a sticker or something that you just can't find? There's one frame that's really high. I call it my unicorn frame. It's a 1998 Terrible One barcode. There's only a hundred of them made by Spooky Dave, who's like famous, well known welder back in the day. He did like the first runs of like kink frames, uh, some metal frames, T1 frames and maybe a couple others but no one wants to get rid of it like if you have one like yeah you keep it. it's but like I've, a pokemon I've, card <laughs> yeah like yeah my holographic like charizard tracking, <laughs> tracking down these other really really rare frames to trade for that so i'm confident i'm gonna fucking get one but hell yeah um yeah that's definitely my my unicorn frame but a frame that i never would have ever imagined that somehow i have is this guy which some people might recognize, but it's, well, you need to see this side. It's Taj's actual oh, frame that he painted. This is the last Hoffman frame that he wrote, his Taj frame in 97 before he started Terrible One. And he painted this, hand painted this on here, counting down to yeah. T1. So this is literally the frame that was like Whoa. the first, like iconology, like, that led to the start of terrible one so like for me as like a diehard taj fan terrible one fan i i had a hoffman flash which he wrote for a little bit which has the same like kind of wishbone design like it's the craziest thing ever that like that's special frame and it's one of the most historic like frames that i would consider in in mid-school bmx for anybody that's into taj or t1 or anything so that's super I'm gonna dope. build that bike up exactly how how he wrote it, and that's gonna be a very fun project. But fuck yeah, dude, that's amazing, man. Yeah. I'm looking at it, and this is before integrated. Uh, what's it called? Integrated headset. Yep. In the frame, like you got to get the dude. It makes me think of like King King uh, headsets. All oh, those, yeah. all that shit, dude. It's trippy. Those are the sickest ones. They're still really fucking expensive. <laughs> yeah, they're the shit, and then profile stuff yeah oh, yeah that's yeah all that that's like dude the the stuff that's the most popular and is the dopest is like all the old american made like all the old snm stuff all the old standard stuff t1 like hoffman like everything american made from back in the day is like it's, the it's shit. funny like without knowing i had really good fucking taste as a kid like <laughs> all the stuff that i had or wanted is now like you know fucking what 20 years, 25, or no, I guess, yeah, up to like 25 years later, it's still the dopest, like most desirable stuff. So it's, That's it's dope. I think I'm like trying to track down this old shit. I'm like, damn, like, why is this stuff so expensive? I'm like, fuck. <laughs> you like, like the good aged, shit, man. You had a good eye. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. I want to know. So we've mentioned earlier, like, let's talk about how you met. So Dennis, you met through MySpace. He's just a 13 year old shredder from down there. Um, what about Chad? How'd you meet Chad? So I would go stay with Dennis often and he would come stay with me and that we went to a real ride contest, which was turned into the compound in Riverside. And um, <clears throat> Chad was there on a little two hip play a boy. Like, I don't even know if it was a 20 inch, maybe it was an 18. He was just this like little kid shredding the dirt jumps. I want to say he was riding like, I don't know if it was the pro set, but he was definitely riding like the bigger set than any other fucking kid his size. And I don't think we ever even really like chatted much at that. I just could tell like him and Dennis knew each other from racing or whatever. Mm -hmm. That was my first time I saw him. And then um, just from riding Claremont, he would he'd be that little kid at the park. Um, I remember he had a free coaster and a gyro and his bike was way too big for him. And he'd be doing bar spins and the bike would be landing before his hands were on the bars, but he was fucking doing them. Hell yeah. And I had just started, like me and Dennis bought a VX 2000. I was 17. Dennis was 15. And that was right at the same era where I was at the skate park and started seeing Chad. And I filmed, ended up just filming a video of Chad. And that was the first video that I ever filmed, edited, and got paid for. And it was a vital video and I got $300 for it. And I Dude, was, that's huge like, back then, man. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, holy <laughs> shit, like I can make 
like money, like filming, like this is fun and I enjoy it. And like, I can do this. And like, I think maybe like I got paid for some random footage of Dennis before that, but like never like edited anything. It was just like, Hey, film this and we'll buy the footage or whatever. So I think like doing that and like the process of it, like got me hooked. Hell and, yeah. Yeah. That's what it all, it's, it's funny. Like I, I've definitely mentioned it multiple times on Instagram, but like I've lost track of, I think I've, I think I've done at least like 13 video parts or something with Chad since we started. And like, he's the one that started my career and that's badass. did this rock star part like last year. And I'm like, fuck, it's crazy. Like we're still how far this. you've come from the yeah. VX 2000. What's that yeah. video called? How, how can f- people it's, watch that one? It was just a vital video that just played. It's probably gone now because I think yeah, vital died player or whatever went to shit, but I still have a file of the video somewhere, but it's so bad. Like the, the worst cleared, like I could have made a better song, like with my eyes closed and not knowing what I'm doing. than the but song they have happy. you go through but a like, corporate library back then them. it was real bad, but and like some like Red Bull girls that were handing out drinks at the skate park did like a little, like, Oh, this is Chad Curley on vital. Like, it was so bad. But like, <laughs> that sounds the amazing. spoke for itself and he was fucking a little mini and yeah, like, it was videos like that that helped like him get on the radar of like low C and premium and everything. So yeah, damn, um, that's wild to think about. So that was my next question is like, how do you get into filming? And it sounds like you, you got the VX 2000 and then started and then off yeah, to the races. I, I credit it all to Dennis, you know, like he, I'd go down to San Diego and ride with those guys. And like, they were doing crazy shit every day. Like I was the guy that would roll up to something 30 times and not do it. And then I was like, fuck, if I had a camera, like if, if I was going to film this and if I at least ate shit and I had a clip for it, like I'd go for it, you know? Yeah. I think filming is what changed my whole mindset on riding because I was literally that guy that wouldn't get myself to do anything. So the second I got a camera, I was like, fuck, I can push myself just like these guys do because now I have like a external motivation for it. Yeah. Same. I can relate to that big time. As soon as filming got brought into it, I was like, oh, I want to go harder, you know, and exactly that's, that's the move that's yeah so up. thanks thanks to dennis like i mean obviously you know dennis's career tra- trajectory like from him riding for nike and matador and all these crazy companies like i was like the guy in his corner there to film it all that's so, so sick like without even really knowing like i just had all the pieces to the puzzle to to get my foot in the door and then i mean yeah start with dennis i can you can go anywhere from there i got really lucky to just be submersed in that that's yeah super- like to the, the amount of talent, like I didn't even have to leave San Diego and I could have a full-time job filming, you know, like between the spots and the riders that we had. That's so sick. I made out there. So like, I don't know, I feel the stars really aligned for me. Like I didn't have much going on, got kicked out of school, hated school, didn't have a job I liked. I was like, tried to go to college and do my GE, but I didn't know what to do. It was like, literally, I was just following the steps that people tell you you're supposed to follow. And luckily all the puzzle pieces fell into place and I ended up doing what I, I needed to be doing. Cause if I was supposed to follow the path that everybody else did, I probably would have been a burnout. Like, uh, sadly, a few of my friends were in, in my town that, that never got out and never did anything. So, yeah. So yeah. let's not brush over. You got kicked out of school. What the fuck? What happened? What'd you do? Yeah. I just, I was, um, I was ahead of the curve. I was, uh, those too rec- smart recreationally <laughs> distributing <laughs> medical <laughs> marijuana <laughs> at a young age of, of uh, 17 um, he was a businessman dude it's entrepreneurship yeah i don't i don't recommend that to anybody that was probably one of the lowest points of my life just getting in trouble and getting kicked out of school and putting my parents through all that so definitely uh I tried that line of work for a little bit and I sucked at it, dude. I like, I ended up losing money. I had to be like, dad, I need a thousand dollars or else I'm in trouble. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Not the best. uh, But honestly, like I'm a firm believer that all, all things happen for a reason. I hate that it had to happen like that, but me getting kicked out of high school early, I was um, a couple months into my junior year. Um, I was already older for my grade too. So like, um, I just took the GED and then busted my ass working at a local pizza place in town for a year to save up enough money to where I could move to San Diego and like have enough of a cushion to 
to live nice. for a year while I figured out a job. And my parents told me if I went to college, they'd help me with rent. So I said, fuck it, I'll go for it. I think I lasted one semester in college and then realized that I could make some money filming. And I'm like, fuck it, I'm just going to go for it. And fuck yeah, dude, that's the move. I, yeah, I'm glad I did because, yeah, like I said earlier, I'm not, a, I'm not a guy that's good at working. Like, I'm glad I worked a nine to five. Like, I know what it's like to work like 40 hour weeks and be on that schedule and, and have a boss. I think it instilled the right things in me at a young age and I took that and then you know did my own thing but I'm glad I've at least worked that because I feel like some there's some kids that have had pro careers that came and went and they never even had that like moment of time to like be a normal human and work and all that and I think it makes it a lot harder to get a job yeah after you bro if you never knew what it was like to like do that grind so right I'm grateful to have that experience. I know what it's like and I never want it again. So I'm going to keep busting my ass to, to be my own, my I'm own boss. <laughs> super curious. Cause like living in California is expensive and working at a pizza shop. I can't imagine you're like making a bunch, but how, what was your, if you don't mind sharing it, I don't think this is too personal, but like, what was your goal to save up to move to San Diego? Like what was your safety cushion number? Like how much, like <laughs> five grand? Question. I was making 10 bucks an hour, which at the time was a lot for being a I was like a delivery driver like I'd work four hours in the morning I'd go ride midday and then I'd work four hours at night and I'd get tips so 80 bucks a day plus tips and then yeah. just save it up I want to say I might have had like I don't know like a couple thousand dollars like or something like Fuck it. that's was, enough yeah. I think my rent was 300 bucks Dude, and I miss those I days. Like fully yeah. eaten, like, you know, back then burritos costed like $4. So like, I was like super cheap, you know, back then, like sleep on the floor wherever I can eat at the bare minimum, you know, like we were like full BMX, like scraping to yep. get by back then, but it was kind of normal. Yeah. Oh so, yeah. I think I might've had a couple thousand bucks just like with hopes of like, all right, I'll find a job within a couple of months, hopefully while I'm down there. But I think I maybe had a six month cushion of like, nice I can pay my rent and eat cheap and not go anywhere i wasn't tra really, really yeah. traveling or anything but yeah so different, different day sold, and age. Uh, oh sorry go ahead no that was it i was just saying like nowadays like a couple thousand bucks <laughs> it doesn't go very kid. far yeah it's wild <laughs> man i don't know if it's because like we get older and you like have more responsibility and expenses or because i dude i remember i was paying 200 bucks for rent living in a room in a bmx house and you know maybe spending 10 15 bucks a day on food but i was smoking cigs i was spending nine eight bucks nine bucks a day on that but oh, yeah. still like scraping scraping by living that life dude i love it and you sold a video to vital was that your first taste of like okay oh shit i could do it because i think i can relate to that so hard because i remember crooked world espn there was that couple that couple period of years where people were getting paid to submit bmx videos to these websites and yep. it's like that came and went but i'm glad For i got sure. a little taste of it it was so exciting to be able to like i was in college and i got to tell my professor like yeah i've sold a couple of uh videos to espn you know like yeah, <laughs> so yeah. even though it's just the espn like bike blog through uh tunny hey. who who all did you get to sell some videos to because you're um, surrounded by all the the best riders so what did you do vital did you do yeah it was a lot of vital videos back then um i wasn't like a staff whatever but like it was pretty consistent i did a lot um and then just like random sponsor videos from the people around town like i remember my first like proper video i did with somebody that was like really like out of my like scene or whatever it was like stefan lanchner came to town i met him riding for nike 6.0 they did like a weird like partners in crime like project i remember that in town whatever <clears throat> yeah i was like a part of that and i met stefan and then i think dennis also knew stefan from nike stuff so like stefan came out to san diego and like i filmed a video of him for carhartt and that was when i just got an hd camera and that was like my first project where i was kind of like oh shit like this guy's like flying to san diego and i'm gonna like make this video yes. and put the sponsor logos in it and everything i was like kind of stressing but um i remember that being like kind of like a, a pivotal point for me um doing that and like yeah switching to hd and, and what everything. was your first hd camera it was a hpx 170 same yeah. 
same camera I shot the market video with, but I eventually progressed to having a HPX 250 and a 170. But yeah, just normal, like, you know, what was it 1280, 720, just yeah. like normal, like 60p, like the most minimal HD that it's like barely technically HD 1280, 720, dude. I, yeah. I remember those days for sure. But that's... yeah, that's the camera that started it all. And I pretty much rocked that that Panasonic set up all the way until the end of the market video and like, yeah, way alive, two Panasonic zoom cameras and dabbled with a six sixty D DSLR for a while for second angles, but I never understood how a DSLR worked and <laughs> aperture and shutter speed and all that shit. Like all the footage from that camera was completely garbage. It was all like <laughs> auto. You didn't know what like, you were doing. Up. So I like got rid of that thing and just bought another, I, I was in Russia and we were, very, very uh, heavily liquored up. And this dude's like, I got an HPX, I'll sell you. And I'm like, fuck it, like, I'll buy it. And I remember the next morning I woke up, I'm like, fuck, I think I just bought another camera last night. It was like a <laughs> $500 camera. It was the best mistake or the best decision I ever made. But then I had two of the same cameras. And then for filming, like all the homies knew how to use that camera. Like yeah. it was straightforward and easy. So like that was the best thing. So like the whole market video got upgraded because now there's always two real angles instead of like one still shot right. one zoom angle. So like that was great because Chad was good at filming. Rob was good at filming. Dennis was good at filming. Like I always, Everybody. Connor was good at filming. Like those dudes, I always used to joke back then is those dudes are better filmers than a lot of filmers were yeah without even trying because they were there to film some of the gnarliest shit ever and you couldn't really fuck it up yeah the pressure's I, on you better do good you know yeah, yeah i put a lot of trust in those dudes and, and they all they all crushed it for me I, I still to this day feel more comfortable filming with uh a rider that films than just a straight filmer because i feel like you just relate with them on that level where like they're not going to do you dirty yeah from, like, you know on the angle or like whatever like they know what that shit looks like when they're the rider so exactly always... and there's certain angles to film tricks at that make the trick look so much better and uh, i don't know they it's not like they're hard fast rules but there's there's a couple of rules in filming bmx tricks like i don't know for for me 360s down a stair set there's a specific side that i think it looks best on um do you have any anything like that that you uh that you have nitpicky about about filming bmx tricks and any particular rules um I'm trying to think i know there's definitely some like cardinal sins back in the day that, but i'm trying to think of like what what now the uh zoom fish not down <laughs> not um, down the sideways fish um wasn't into that yeah um cardinal I mean, sins. this is just my personal opinion i'm sure i've done plenty of things that people weren't into so take it with a grain of salt but i remember those two things nice. i wasn't i wasn't super into um and then i don't know like yeah i feel like sometimes people just use cut in extra shots just to cut them in but like yeah, i just no try purpose. to have purpose behind all my like if i have like two lead-ins like i'm using those two lead-ins to show the fucked up run up and the speed of it or something like that but sometimes i feel like people are just trying to cut to the music and just cut shit in there just to cut it in there but i try and be very purposeful and in, in anything that i do and don't have to rely on showing the trick multiple times if you can show the run in and the run out and and like complete everything like okay there's an uphill run up show that and there's a fucking pull on the run out show that but i don't need to like show the trick four times to like tell yeah. that story big time so i just try and be i learned over the years from being a grom and filming to like thinking about the editing side of it while you're filming and i think yeah. that was a huge thing like okay like this person's blowing past the camera from right to left so then the next angle needs to also be from right to left. I don't want to switch 180 degrees to the other side and then yeah. fucking with your eyes that they're like coming by like that, you know, and it's just little things like that, that if you start to think ahead and you already know how it's going to cut together, it's going to look so much more seamless and better. And those are just the things that you learn as a kid or like whatever. Whenever. It's wild that you learn that on your own through experience, because that's the type of shit that they sit down and like, will give you a textbook on you know when they teach you film school like that's that the right to left and making it not uh 
not fuck your brain up while you're trying to watch it and you're just like wait he was just over there you know like that yeah totally and it's like i'll go back and watch some stuff now and i'll be like oof you know like yeah before i i knew that kind of stuff but like yeah i mean i i watched a lot of skate videos i took a lot of inspiration from 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 them and how they did it and that was pretty much my my textbook was just watching other videos and then fuck i was never afraid to hit up a skate filmer and ask them a question about their gear or whatever you know so hell yeah, yeah that's what's it, up um, <laughs> and now you're filming mountain bike shit i mean not not designated but i know you did a project with mr seminook um maybe more than one project with him is it how much different is it filming mountain biking than it is filming bmx it is very different um i remember when i first started filming mountain biking i genuinely had hopes of coming in and being able to really do something different with the filming of it and it's so hard to like you have to work around the elements like i can have as much desire and drive to like make an angle look something different but like if you're filming on a trail that's got six feet of bushes on both sides like you can only see the trail from the front or from the back or overhead you know yeah. so it's, i might want to be here but like i can't see anything so it's like there's so much of it that's uncontrolled where it really makes you have to scratch your head of like how the fuck do i document this to where it's going to truly show what's going on and not take away from the speed the steepness the gnarliness whatever like you go to a stair set and like like you said like you know what you like and what looks good there's not like there might be like a garbage can in the way or a pole or whatever but for the most part you're a little more there's elements uncontrolled elements obviously cars parked there that weren't supposed to be whatever each of them have their own things but um, definitely a lot harder to shoot mountain biking in that sense. And then also like not like BMX, like there's times where it lights been a consideration, but for the most part, if you're feeling it, you're feeling it and you're fucking filming the clip and we meet up in the morning and we ride and shoot until dark. Yeah. Mountain biking, we only shoot in good light, like huh. yeah. only early morning, only evening, or if it's overcast all day, then you're hyped. You can shoot, yeah. all day, but like, the riders themselves also are not into disco light, spotty, hot spots, all that shit. Yeah. So refreshing in that sense where I think the riders in mountain biking care and have more interest in the filming side because they know like what looks good also, oh. which is awesome because like I've definitely, even in my, like these last couple projects I did in BMX, like I filmed a really gnarly line of Chad in his rockstar part uh he does like nose 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 bar and then like pedals through a hallway it's all in the shade in the shade and then 10 feet before the stair set it's like a 14 stair that he trucks he pops out into the sunlight yeah and i'm like dude like is there any way we could come back in like two hours and shoot this it'll look amazing but if not don't feel bad i'm totally happy to shoot it right now but if it's something that you'd be okay with doing later it would look way better and he's like honestly like i'm kind of in the mode right now like let's get it i'm like cool let's get it yeah like, what'd you end up I, doing did you do a nd filter thing that they do or just, just like found manually this, adjust or you found the with happy the, medium like the, with the uh with the red and fish eye there really wasn't anything i could do i just like <clears throat> you know, tried to like find the little happy medium where it wasn't too um too overexposed or too dark and luckily with the red like dynamic range is pretty good you can oh yeah are you shooting flat with the red then obviously yeah like yeah. yeah yeah and that's the whole point i don't know for people who don't know i one thing that you said that i when i learned i was like oh word that makes sense like when it's overcast the clouds are providing like a you know a soft box a natural soft box so everything looks amazing and so when i learned that i was like oh that's interesting like a cloudy day is the best day for um for filmers and then also the dynamic range is uh you you explain it explain dy dynamic range to somebody who doesn't understand what filming is i mean i'm like the least technological dude but it's pretty much like in my very limited knowledge it's just like i don't even know how to properly explain it but it's like some cameras are better than others but it's like being able to like see both sides in like a an even light to where like I don't, yeah, I honestly, like, I don't even, I it's, understand it in like whatever, but I don't even know how to explain it. Like it's, yeah, like some cameras you can manipulate the the colors after and 
and everything but yeah i don't even know how to properly explain like but i was so confused when i first learned it but like why does it look like shit it looks so flat but the point is so that you're not overexposing your highlights and you're not uh, like underexposing the lowlights so you're getting as much data as possible and then in post you can go in and make it look exactly how you want so instead of having it look good straight out of camera because if you do that then um like the the highlights are blown out or the shadows are too dark but if you film it flat like s log or whatever red whatever they call it there i'm not i'm not the most technological thing but the whole point is to not have anything be blown out and not underexposed so it's just like when it when it looks all flat like that you get the most data and then you can edit it and color grade it and color grading dude is a whole fucking it's a different sport like there's yeah, people that make a living that. just color grading dude i i, I don't fuck with it either color. <laughs> nice <laughs> smart dude there's stick color with it titles i every title and every video i've ever made in my life is done by kelly bolton hell yeah shout out kelly bolton dude and yeah. the market the market video like the 3d oh, yeah. style yeah. dope that's yeah. what's up yeah there's, that there's shit is tedious that, yeah there's things that i'm <laughs> happy to like learn but when it comes to like stuff like that like sound like proper sound mixing uh color and titles like yeah i could do it but i'd rather pay someone who's very good at it and have a better product, yeah. the, the hours of doing a mediocre job when i could just pay them and they could do it properly so yeah for real dude speaking like, of audio the some of the brandon seminuk videos where it just sounds so beautiful like there's no there's no song it's just the sound of his bike in the dirt yep i do you know like how they did that yeah um the, it's, it's called paying to do your audio <laughs> <laughs> yeah so like you, it's not it's not re audio from the shoot like especially on this one that i was geeking sometimes out sometimes it is yeah sometimes I, it's I, real I, audio but then this dude is taking a ratchet wrench and recording sounds and posts and doing foley art which is just like faking the sound and then like it's so trippy i even i emailed the guy who made the brandon seminuk video like i'm zooming in looking at his bike looking for a microphone like how does this sound so fucking good and it's all like just kind of fake it's put in there and after the fact like to you know, simulate the sound and it's i'm i, I was like it's so that's a whole nother ball game yeah, there's a, a very well-known audio guy called Keith White. Uh, shout That's out who I emailed. Yeah, yeah, Keith White. Keith, yeah. Does, Keith does all my videos. Uh, he yeah. has a sound library. I mean, I'm I'm not. I can't say for certain, but um, I want to say that all his sounds are most, or at least the bike noises are are from previously recorded bike noises. I'm sure there's some random like dirt dropping and stuff like that that he's like done himself, but um he's got an audio library like i did a mountain bike video recently for a wheel company they have a very specific um driver sound and i was like hey like how's your industry nine like audio library looking i shot a lot of drone clips for this video and there's no audio and he's like right. oh, you're good so like he's so using sick. actual audio from other projects that he has that same sound for um that's super it, dope it's night and day difference but if you go Maybe maybe the general human wouldn't hear it, but Nathan Williams' "Why Not" part and Chad Curley's last Rockstar Lockdown part, I had Keith do the audio on those. And nice. I'll have to watch, go rewatch those. If you watch both of those videos and then go back and watch any other BMX video, you will notice the tires rolling out, rolling over rocks. Like the, it's not. I didn't have the best microphone for Nathan's stuff um chad should be a lot better but yeah like um on camera mic as best as i can eliminating any other like outside noises and then having him do it um very noticeable difference in roll-ins roll-outs the whooshes on the slow-mos everything like if yeah, you go back and watch those i bet you'll be like holy shit like it is way different and then even before that like chad's x games uh real bmx part I put a, a lav mic on him and I went back with him and we faked a lot of the noises after we shot the clips. So nice. I could cut in, like take out my skateboard noise and cut in just clean audio of him grinding and mandling and stuff. And like, oh. I don't think it was ever acknowledged by any of the judges, but it's like, those are the things to me that like, I know, okay, I've done everything I can to make yeah. this video as good as possible, even though 
the, the judges who aren't filmers and editors would probably never know. That's my only gripe with real BMX is I wish there was a, a, a filmer judge filmer editor in there to be like, Hey, you guys should take knowledge, note of like the effort that was put in on this side of the production that wasn't even acknowledged in other ones. Like yeah. oh, actually, circling back further to one of your previous questions, one of my big pet peeves in BMX is people that run two angles and they either don't have audio for the second angle or the audio is shit and they leave it like, dude, the audio from the first good angle, you can put that on the second one and you can change the pitch of it and yep. make it sound right. Like if you have good audio for one trick, don't fuck the other angle with shit audio. Use that same audio in there and manipulate it to work. And it yeah. always is so weird to me when people put out like a legit ass video part and there's like sketchy audio in there on clips that they already had clean audio for. And I'm like, dude, you, you have everything right there. You just like missed the boat. Yeah. That's, dude, that's one little nerdy thing that like, I, <clears throat> to me, if you made the most iconic BMX video part ever with no audio, you've mm -hmm. lost so much life like it. to it. People don't yeah. realize how important the audio is. And that's one thing that I took notice to pretty much like right when I got my red, and I started fanning out on like uh, Russell Hogden, like skate videos. He was like the New Balance guy. Okay. Um, he did that like red direct video with the empty uh, apocalyptic looking LA city. Like, I don't know. Oh, yeah. Heard, yeah. But, yeah. Uh, the audio in his videos, I was always tripping. I'm like, dude, are you like laving these guys up? Like, why is the audio so good? And from that day on, this is like 2015 or 16, I think, when I got my red, like, I was like, dude audio i'm putting like i would buy i had an external mic and i'd be like setting up my microphone next to the spot if i'm filming Smart. like telephoto down the street i'm setting up another camera up close just to get audio so i have the natural audio yes and i just kind of nerded out on that so that's like one thing that um that's why now i'm like stoked when i get to do bmx stuff because now i take these things that i've learned from mountain biking like no one was bringing like sound design into bmx or like right. some of like you know like there wasn't really dudes using like full gimbals and like shooting red and dropping videos in 4k like at the time and like that's the stuff that like i might not have like stayed in the bmx industry like you pushed it though dude. as i would have but i tried my hardest to bring anything that i learned from outside of it and implicate it into my work to try and elevate at least my projects to the highest possible way like level that i could yeah and at least like contribute that to it even if i'm not like in the mix like doing things like i used to be like at least i can try and hope to elevate the the quality a little bit from the things i've learned outside of the industry i didn't just like all right later like i'm out i'm gonna go do this mountain bike thing. right like, yeah i still love to like come in and and now like i don't give a fuck what i get paid for a bmx video i'd be so hyped to like get paid dog shit money to go film for a week with my homies and make a bmx yes, video. Dude. like i don't know how to clear the music I can hang out with my homies. I can like make something really dope in a totally different way than I used to. So like now the tables have turned. We're like, now I'm like stoked and I want to do some cool BMX stuff. We're like, I'm not okay. bothered with like trying to get every penny I can out of these companies. Cause I'm not living off of it like that. Right. Yeah. Or when I was a kid, I'm like, dude, I need to get what, you know, like I can't go on this trip to another country and do all this work for 1500 bucks. Like you're, no right. shot, you know? Yeah. For like, real. It's cool. The times have changed and now I can like, you know, try and bring something different to, to my, my work just from some experiences outside of, of the industry. It's so interesting. Like over time, you kind of like reach levels of like, okay, so you first get a camera now you got to figure out like the basic settings of like shutter speed and color or white balance and all that stuff. And then you're like, okay, I'm good. And then you realize like, oh shit, I'm not good. And then you gotta like, and then at a certain level, you reach the level of like audio is the most important thing. Like you take that for granted and old videos, like full productions from companies just straight up had music and no writing audio back in the day. But mm -hmm. at this point, you know, it's so important. Audio really, it's like a subliminal thing. Like you don't, it, the viewer doesn't think about it. And especially if you're not a filmmaker, then you don't, you don't even think about it, but it like creates the experience and gives the, it gives it a whole nother level. There's yeah, there's levels to the shit and you, uh, you pushed it a lot. I was always curious. I wanted to ask you about when you first got your red, like, that costs more than a car. Like, how did you, 
how did you acquire your first red camera i took a massive hit and i financed the fuck out of it and Damn, i got yeah bent, bent over backwards on <laughs> the, uh, the interest rate but i knew i was like this thing's gonna fucking bone me but dude literally i posted a photo of the camera on instagram like just hype that i got it and like i got a dm from uh, a homie named caleb who was an old bmx dude who's like yo like you want to come shoot desert racing like we need another red shooter like I know oh. you just got it, but I know like you shoot BMX, like you'll be fine. And I'm like, fuck yeah. And like, and I got like a real day rate and I'm like, holy fuck, this is, but I knew at that time that, like I said, this was like 2015. Like, I don't know. It, it seems like it's not the same nowadays because now every camera is good. But like back then it was like, you have a red, like you're hired, you know, yeah. like if you know what you're doing and not many people had them, a lot of people had access to them for renting them from production companies and stuff but like if you owned your own red you're getting the sickest day rate and like yeah, yeah so i just knew like all right i love filming bmx but i'm never going to be able to buy a house or like really like elevate my life or make a real career out of like you can make a career in bmx but like i want like a real career and i knew that just filming bmx with a zoom camera was never going to do that for me right so yeah. I just fucking sent it and I almost like bought myself a nice car. Like I wanted a fucking STI and I'm like, dude, like you're going to buy this car, probably going to blow up like all my other friends, STIs, and it's not going to do anything for me or not going to make you money. Yeah. I can fucking send it on this camera and it's going to make me money. And eventually I'll be able to hopefully fucking buy a home. And I'm how so much was the camera when you financed it? 20, 20. How much was the red when you got it? 25, 30, 40, like 50, a whole kit. I think it was like 35. That's so crazy, dude. $35,000 for a camera. And I started with nothing, you know, like I didn't have any lenses or anything. It was like, I needed the brat, the <clears throat> beam out batteries, the lenses, the fucking, the cards were like 2,500. Like it was like, it's dude, so back, crazy. Yeah. Back then it was so annoying too. Cause when I bought that camera, there was like two reds and I was like, cool. Like reds, not like Canon. They're not dropping a new camera every week. Like I can buy this camera and it'll be relevant for like five <laughs> years until I pay it off. And then I can buy another one. And dude, I bought that camera and one year later, they started fucking dropping cameras every year. Yep. And I'm like, you motherfucker, <laughs> exactly what I, I went to you for because you didn't do it. So my camera <laughs> became irrelevant very quickly. And luckily I, I was able to like pay it off quickly and, and I upgraded and got another one. But dude, when I upgraded and got my other one, they gave me like, they gave me like, fuck, what was it? Five grand for the body that I paid 20 for. <laughs> and I'm just like, this is fucked. Like yeah, I got more fun. money trading it back to them than I would have if I sold it. That's so, so like, fucked. Yeah, it's yeah, amazing it how it goes. What is yeah. the equivalent in today's world? What's the camera that you think like, oh shit, I need that one. What's the what's the hottest shit right now? Do you think? I have it. I think there's nicer cameras and newer cameras, but to me, the Red Gemini is the best action sports camera. It's got low enough frame rates for me, and the low light is insane. Like for nice. shooting mountain biking at like. 120 frames a second in dark woods with no light coming yeah. through the fucking Gemini crushes. You don't even have to go too gnarly on that, on that low aperture to like get that light because it's so good. Wow. No noise, cool. Like no, no neat video. Like everything I ever shot on my Scarlet dragon, which was my first camera. I shot a lot of night footage in my BMX career and everything I shot on my red was fucked. Like so noisy. My led lights weren't strong enough for how shit that camera was and yeah a lot of my night footage most of my night footage with my red my old red was really bad yeah like, once i got the gemini i'm like dude like if i can go <laughs> back and reshoot all that shit yeah he's so hyped but yeah to me there's like the new raptor and there's the komodo and there's all these other cameras but i have so many friends that have the nicer ones and they're still using leaning on my gemini for red gemini i'm gonna look into the red gemini and to explain to people who don't know that when you say noisy, that just means like when you when it's too dark and you're bumping the ISO in your camera, like it creates this artificial grain, like the footage looks grainy. That's what the noisy, noisy shit means. Some That's people dope. like that stuff. I remember, I think it was Ennis was like, dude, I love that shit. And I'm just like, <laughs> he <laughs> like, would say that. Dude. I'm <laughs> trying to get away from that stuff. Smoking a like, cig, he's like, I love that grainy shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah there's, a, there's a time and a place, but yeah, not not into the, the grain, but 
I love Tony Ennis, dude. I just saw him. He was out in Arizona with Garrett and Johnny for a little fiend trip. And I got to kick it with them one night at ASU and watch Tony do his thing filming and kick it. And it, I just love that guy. I remember some, the only other time I've really hung out with him, we were walking down the Vegas strip at some Nora cup and just gambling and smoking cigs and casinos. And Tony Ennis is just just the the dude, you know? He's like the big Lebowski of BMX oh, yeah. filming, you know? He's the For dude. For sure. I love, love Tony. I've always been a huge fan of, from from his <clears throat> final days of, you know, yeah. the little boys and then End Search and then everything he's done Fiend related. Like, I love Tony's work. I love Tony. And I think he's got a, a signature touch to him that is. Truly, yeah. Hand in hand with, with BMX. I think he's a, a great dude to, to keep putting out videos that have yeah. that that feel you know he hasn't like stepped away from from his vibe and i i think yeah. his vibe is, is has a great place in, in bmx it's so exciting every time fiend is about to drop a video i'm just like let's go dude i hear they're you know doing one this year i don't know i asked garrett i was like when is the video going to be done and he said i don't know ask that fucker over there <laughs> it's, it's, it's up to, it's up to the artist Tony, you know? yeah Johnny was telling me like 80% of the shit that he's filmed with Fiend isn't out yet. And I'm like, Ooh, I'm excited, yeah. man. That's going to be dope. That's awesome. What's coming up on the uh, horizon for you, Christian Miguel? Shoot, man. I've got a few BMX projects that still need to come out. Um, I have a Corey Martinez uh, video part, which damn will likely be his last like Corey part, you know, like, long term like really going in on it part fuck yes um that's been in the works for the last i don't want to let the timeline make people think one thing or another because it's not like we've been like filming hard and doing stuff for this amount of time it's just like from when we started it to where we're at it's been like six years um and then i'm even more embarrassed to say the demarcus paul video part is even beyond that amount of time but that one's fully my fault on why it's not coming out. Like when I lived in San Diego, we were filming, filming. I think we hit the like five year mark or six year mark while I was still living there. And there's like 16 minutes of footage. It's going to be like a two song part with a whole leftovers video part, kind of like Nathan's like two yeah. videos will come out of it. Um, but it just sucks because like when I was living there, like I feel like Demo was riding and busy and had his family and things were going on. So like it kind of like finishing it wasn't really like too big of a priority. We kind of like let it like there was probably two years that went by where we only got like six or seven clips, you know, but then like by the time he finished it, I moved up here full time mountain biker, like filming mountain biking and everything. So like now like he's done his part and now it's on me. But like now that when when it was before like i had all the time in the world and i was fully invested on just bmx stuff and then now the tables turn he finished his part of it and now it's on me to edit it and now my whole life's changed so like i i tell him all the time but i deeply apologize for how long it's taken but i'm just like i got so much shit going on that like i really want to like dive into his part and and edit it the way that it needs to be edited and i i've been struggling with the songs like i love the songs but like i'm sure you've had it like you can love oh, yeah. the song as much as you want and then once you go to edit i'm like fuck this is hard like yeah there's songs that i've had that like boom 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 like everything just drops into place and it just feels so fucking natural and this one like the intro of it's really fucking throwing me for a curveball and i've huh. i think i've got the intro like to where i'm happy with it and now it's just like getting these first couple clips in in order to where like the song really kicks in like that's always the hardest part for me editing a video is i really put a lot of thought into the intro i want every fucking clip in there to have meaning and make sense and i probably am making this way harder on myself than i need to because i know i'm really in my head about a lot of shit that no one will ever notice but i don't know what makes you stand where... out though that makes that sets you apart dude that's a good uh, I thing appreciate it. it's a blessing yeah, and a curse want... I won't touch the rest of the video until the intro is done because my yeah. my biggest personal pet peeve is when I've edited a clip into the video and I love where it's at and then it has a better place somewhere else. So like I, I yeah. make the intro how I want it and then I move on and whatever footage is left, I can use it with the footage. But like it sucks when I'm like, oh, this song, this clip would be so perfect in the intro, but I love it right in front of the clip 
you know, where, where it's at. So like, yeah, that's one thing that, um, my, hopefully my computer's not going to die. It says it's, or it's connected. Um, but, um, yeah, that's like one thing that, um, I try and just always make sure I, I have sorted is the intro needs to be done and then, uh, then I can move forward. So it kind of sucks because like I could probably get the rest of it, like edited really quickly. Cause once the song kicks in, like that shit's just like, boom, boom, boom. But yeah. the intro all fucking loosely. <laughs> so it's crazy yeah. how that goes, dude. And the, totally. The, you can get stuck and then you're just fucked like i i don't know i have to step away and be like I, I don't even know dude and then maybe come back in a bit and be fresh what's your editing process have you ever like for market editing that dvd <clears throat> what was the what was that like market i wish i kept a tally market was fueled by red wine and spliffs <laughs> um, i literally would like consciously like edit something and make sure I liked it when I'm drinking, when I'm high and when I'm sober. And yep. if I could watch the sections in all states of mind and be happy with it, then I was good. Then it's good. Off. Yeah. <laughs> I pretty much locked myself in my room for two months straight and edited that video. And yeah, like I'd edit until I couldn't anymore and I'd call it a night and then I'd wake up the next morning, fresh, fresh eyes, fresh mind. And if I could watch it, nothing like stood out to me and bugged me. Yeah. Then hyped on it and and i still think to this day i can go back and watch that video and just watch it and not pick it apart because i felt that i did my due diligence on it yeah. and i'm happy with it and i'm that to me is like the best um reward for my work like obviously the, the earlier stuff is i was so like such a grom like it's hard to be like super proud of a lot of it but like from like the market days and like beyond that like i can watch most of that stuff and be I'm like cool I probably would have cut it the same way now you know like yeah. I, I'm happy with how it went together and I think I did a a job that justified the the writer and, and the song and everything and yeah I try and just like I edit until I hit a roadblock and if it's really fucking with me I usually just chill and like maybe a day maybe a couple of days whatever and then I come back and then I like get back into it and I feel that that works way better like so I've never really liked the, like I did a lot of film contests over my career and yeah. I love them but the whole like all right we're done filming we have one night to edit like that shit I always like dude it was so hard for me because I knew it could be so much better but you had to just like get it done so right. I never liked editing under a deadline because those are the projects that I look back on and like they'll never hit the same way or feel the same way just knowing right. that I, like I didn't do everything I could to make it as good as it should be yeah, dude, mediocre at best. I set the premiere date for it and then didn't edit it until like I started editing the full length DVD a week before the premiere. And then it wound up to where I had to pull two all nighters right before the premiere and get it done and put it out. And it just luckily worked out to where it like went well. But fucking a dude, like that. I don't know. The procrastinating is terrible i like sure. i respect people who are like okay i got this i got two months and then just slowly chip away at it i know mastroni does that it sounds like you do that but me i was just a fucking mess and i just luck <laughs> same thing i locked myself in a room but not for two months i'd lock myself in a room for 72 hours and just <laughs> that's funny well i always heard so many stories and i'd been to a handful of premieres where they're like the dudes are editing the video on the way to the premiere and then yeah like, dude it, and then you get the dvd and it's totally fucking different yeah so it's like i never wanted to be that guy i'm like i want this video to be exactly what it should be and be happy with it before anyone sees it and then when they see it that's what they're going to see after like i don't want to be like all right cool it's good enough for the premiere like let's get it out there like right. I, ha I heard enough stories of that before where like for the market video i'm like this shit is going to be done Fucking, I think the hardest thing was just getting the hard copies done in time, which nowadays people don't have to worry about because it doesn't exist. But yeah, I definitely made sure that like we had to like have the video done and delivered with enough time to where I think they needed like a two or three week turnaround to get the hard copies. So like at least I didn't even have a choice to be like the guy editing because like our big thing with the market video, I remember is like we have to have videos to sell at the premiere. Yeah. If you're going to spend, I mean, this might be a irrelevant conversation now because full lengths aren't even really a thing, but like back in the day, 
it never made any sense to me why a brand would pour a lot of money and a lot of time into two years of filming for a project. And then they're going to rush the final step of the prod, the most important part of it. They're going to rush it. And then they're going to go to a premiere and they're not going to have a fucking copy of the video for you to buy. Like that is your most prime time. Like oh, yeah. every person in that room should buy that video if they really enjoyed it. And if 100%. you're going to get that opportunity, I think you blew it. So that was one thing that the Dennis shared um, the same same mindset with me is we have to have videos on deck at the premiere. Like I want to watch a video, get hyped, give you my fucking money, take that video home. And I want to watch that fucking video again. I don't want to be like, cool, I'm going to wait like a month until they figure out how to get this right. thing duplicated and edited like that shit. I never understood. So I'm glad that Dennis was on the same page and kind of let me like take the reins on, on things like that. where like, we know what's important to us and, and we, we implicated in there. And then another weird little thing that we did, which I always loved that I haven't seen any other videos do aside from the video that we stole it from is uh, the America video. I remember like back in the day, anyone to watch BMX videos, you need a DVD player or a PlayStation. Mm -hmm. You put the video in, you watch the video. When the video is done, the fucking menu comes up. The amount of times I was sleeping over at a friend's house and you wake up in the middle of the night and the fucking DVD menu is just like playing over and over and over. It was so annoying. And that America video after it sat for 60 seconds, it played the video again. Ah. And I was like, Dude, that is fucking genius because nobody shuts the TV off after the video finishes. They yeah. all leave it there. Most of the time, the venue's got some music or something going on that's annoying. So people just like get over it. And we, I hit up Manzuri and I figured out how they did it. And we did that to the market video. So now, whether you want to or not, that shit's it's playing again. <laughs> and then also <laughs> cool. for like any bar or shop or whatever, yes. it's just going to loop all day. You don't have to go in there and hit play again and do anything. So like that was one little random thing that like we implemented in the market video that maybe like slid under the radar. But to me, that was one of the like the best little things that we figured out because yeah, like I said, the amount of times I'd be sleeping in a friend's house and you wake up at like two in the morning and the fucking DVD menu is still playing. It was right. so annoying. And like, this is the best way to like, you're going to keep watching it. Like I'll get sucked into watching a video again, just because it auto played, you know? Yeah. It's like, all right, I'll watch it again. There's a couple of things that you kind of brought into BMX videos that I was like, I'm not sure if you were the first, but to do like an iTunes sale for videos. But yeah, I think you, uh, with the digital download and selling it through iTunes was a big deal. I forget exactly which project I'm thinking of, but. Market, um... market was iTunes and then Nathan <clears throat> was the first, like. To my knowledge, the first digital download to buy as a video part since like fucking um, what was the Eli Platt one back in the day and the Brad Sims one? Yeah, like, way what, back, like, my creation. Yep, yep. Yeah, that's trippy yeah. to think about. So what like that, what platform? So like when I finished Mediocre Two after seven years of barely working on it, when I want to do a digital download, what what's the software that I should use? Or I mean, what's I, the, from, the name. From, what I looked around and I, I spoke to Mike Jonas, who's my tech like uh, wizard. He's smart kind of cookie, stuff. dude. Yeah, I felt that Gumroad was uh, was a great Gumroad. for that. Um, maybe now there's other ones or better ones, but from what I gathered from it, it seemed to be a, a great outlet. And yeah, they didn't take like a crazy cut or anything. And yeah, I think, there's, I think there are some people that mentioned that if you didn't, have room on your device to pay for it and download the file like maybe watching it on the player wasn't as great but i kind of thought everybody was going to end up just like having the file yeah uh, so maybe that wasn't as ideal but yeah i think like i just wanted to that was my like way to like try and bring another level of a video part to like okay there's your free web videos um there's your full length dvds that like are few and far between but like i wanted to be in the middle we're like hey we're still going to put the same time effort and everything into this part but we don't want to put it online for free right now it's going to go there eventually anyways so why not try and bring the value up and make it something where people would want to spend the money because people did dude i remember hitting up nathan and i'm like hey like what do you think about doing like a version that cost one more dollar for 4k he's like do you think people will care and he's like i don't know why not like, and we didn't know and dude i didn't do like a final rundown but i would say out of five people like three or four of them 
paid the extra dollar for the higher. Oh yeah. And that helped me like that. Like I was like, okay, it's good to know that like people do care about quality when the option is given to them. Cause at first I was like, Oh, people aren't even going to want to spend money on this. They're going to get the cheapest version they can, whatever. And it was like reassuring to know that like, cool, like, Quality is a thing that does still matter. And most of the people, for sure, more than 75% of the people bought the 4K version instead of the 1080, which was a dollar yeah. cheaper. And that was like, <clears throat> That's nice to know. <laughs> yeah. And I did, I think on this, like, you know, staying current theme, like a, <clears throat> I can picture you producing something that ends up on Netflix in the mountain biking world, you know, something with a little bit of a story, but also just like a hybrid between you know, trick porn and telling a story. Like, I, I think you could bring that. I don't know if it's you or somebody, but like, I think that could be the next venue. But even Netflix is almost like oversaturated and shit at this point. Like, what do you think the future of releasing videos is? What does that look like? I mean, I definitely think it's it's streaming. Um, I think like, it's hard because there's a really, really rad mountain bike video called Death Grip that was on Netflix for a while. But when I was talking to the people back then, because I was trying to do a BMX video on Netflix, like they weren't, maybe the the dynamics changed, but at the time they weren't picking up content to go straight to Netflix. They like wanted it to be out and like for sale and distributed. It's almost like they wanted to like see how it did before they brought it in versus like, we can't, we're not going to take this on straight to us. Um, so I always, my goal was always to make a BMX video and get it on Netflix and yeah. or a mountain bike one would be sweet too, but I don't know how that, um, how it's changed since then. But I mean, that's what I watch all day long. Like I still go on YouTube and cruise that, but like I'm Hulu, Netflix, fucking Peacock. Like I got like six different streaming services between Same. all the shows that I like to watch and stuff. Um, and then like airplanes, like I've seen some pretty rad, like I watched like a fucking snowboard street video on the airplane on an international flight the other day. And it was so, because it was these like super core, I don't know anything about snowboarding, but it was these super core snowboarders pretty much made their own documentary talking about like the battle, like pretty much it felt very much like a BMX video. They're showing you like all the things that go into like building the spots, getting kicked out, go, like breaking your wrist, going to the hospital, getting a cast, coming back out, like filming a clip. It was like, I was like, yeah. this is everything that BMX is. And it's so cool to me that that was on an airplane for any kid, adult, human, whatever, that's just bored to be like, oh, cool. Like, what's this? I don't know anything about snowboarding. Yeah. So and it's, still... it's better that way instead of just like showing the tricks, like if telling the story behind the tricks and all the troubles and tribulations. I'm, I'm, a, I'm leaning. I used to be only tricks. I only care about tricks, blah, blah, blah. But now I'm, as I'm older and like you, you want to appeal to a general audience, you got to like give them something more than just the tricks which which totally. is yeah yeah i think like i i was also the same way very much like action-based edits only and i'm all about storytelling when there's a story to be told mm -hmm. the amount of like horny kooky mountain bike projects i've seen where there's a forced storyline forced, just for yeah. the sake of trying to give a, a consumer more than just the riding and i'm like dude like when there's a good story to tell i'd love to hear it but yep. if there isn't like a true, like interesting story and your guys is just trying to mold some kind of like dialogue to this just to give it more like whatever, like agreed. Yeah. It's terrible. Like just like you said earlier, when your B roll has to have a purpose, so does your story, you know? It's, yeah. it's all gotta like be you know, it has to have a purpose. Yeah, for sure. All right, let's move on to our rapid fire section and wrap this up. We've been going for two hours, dude. Um dude. So, I mean, every every episode we got to do the Mount Rushmore. So, who's your Mount Rushmore of uh, all time BMX riders? That's it's a tough one. Oh man, <laughs> is this the Rushmore is not in in order. It's just yeah, it's just, just four people. Okay, um, I will say Taj Mahalich, Ruben Alcantara, um. Mike Aiken and oh, I, I need to pick like one modern day person, but it's so hard to pick like the one. I mean, it might sound weird, but I, I can't help but pick Dennis, like without yeah. even like, taking away everything that 
I have associated with him just like if, if I was just an outsider looking in it like to me like I always tell people and they ask me about BMX or anything like if you had to pick one ambassador of the sport to like Dennis. this is BMX Dennis yeah. you know and like whether it's his style his his like the his competing like his his personality everything I feel like Dennis is what I would be more than happy with the world seeing and, and based yeah, judgment yeah. on like okay if this is bmx like this shit's fucking cool yeah so, yeah Agreed. i think he, he would round it out with my my modern day uh pick yeah. and, him and yeah. garrett i think are both the the top two ambassadors like they're the they're the modern day dave mira and matt hoffman i think garrett totally. and dennis dennis i got to see i've only seen get gotten to see him ride a couple of times in person but it is just like whoa just sessioning something that like would take a regular rider like all of their balls to go and do and i just got to see him ride in arizona a couple of weeks ago or a month maybe a month or so ago and i was blown away and he's just a cool nice guy at this point i think he's been through i don't know yeah starting at such a young age like he did and getting all the attention but to wind up being a humble amazing fucking dude is uh it's pretty special shout out to dennis you know for sure he's the man like we like i often look at like the the current day riders and i'm like fuck dude like who i mean i'm super jaded i'm not like in the mix like i was before but i'm like who are the the mount rushmore's of like today's day and age when like for me it's hard to see how a rider in today's day and age could ever have the impact that the earlier riders did because the earlier riders were literally setting the standard and creating yeah. thing. And now that it's very much established in there, it's like, who can, who and what can today's day and age riders do? And when I say today's day and age, I mean like the generation after the Dennis's and the Garrett's and, and the Nathan's and stuff like, what can they do to like historically and like, you know, to like have the same impact that the earlier, I don't know if they can, and that's not anything against them, but like, I think the history has been created and set yeah. to like, I don't know what you can do. Like there's like no more banger video parts and DVDs. There's no more interviews and covers and magazines, like all the most important things that solidified these legends of our time. You know, like I said, you're, we're both the same age. Like it's, I don't know what you do or, or who or yeah. how nowadays when it's like what who who had the most viral instagram clip exactly yeah you know what's it gonna be like it's uh, it's a strange dynamic but i mean bmx has always grown it's always been in waves and it's i think no matter what it's gonna keep keep going and keep growing and it's i think it's in a better place than it ever has been with there's more skate parks there's more people riding there's easier access and better bikes than ever so it's like everything's going in the right direction so i, I can't yeah. wait to see where it goes but it's pretty interesting to think like who's gonna be our our yeah. iconic influential people that like carry the flag for bmx when dudes like dennis and garrett are, are taking a back seat and like running their own companies and not like out there fucking pushing it right anymore. which i can't believe they still are dude it's fucking amazing and yeah. even dennis and garrett they've been in it for a long time and they're still getting better and going hard i got yeah. my eyes on like felix felix is up there for me with this new generation courage oh, yeah. adams simone i mean and even them they're not the young guns at this point you know oh. like who are the young the young bucks and what does the future look like how do you stand out in this day and age where it's all just fast content i think it's Corey Walsh said it, you know, it's, there's something very special about putting, saving all your good shit and putting it out in a video part, like follow the Christian Miguel and Nathan Williams. Why not model, you know, like work on something special for a while with a good filmer, which is rare to find a good filmer. Who's like down at this point. That's what everybody complains about is just like, yeah, I want to make it, but I don't have a fucking filmer. But so it's well, like, that's the strangest thing to me that that's like an issue nowadays. Cause I'm like, dude, like Corey, Martinez just dropped an amazing video part and it was all filmed on a fucking iPhone. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. No excuses. Like the amount of effort it took for us to like, like I said, my first sponsor me tape, I had to like, like I made friends with this like kid from San Diego that like filmed this video. Like I, you had to go really out of your way to like create something. And now like, but there's people that are more savvy with making, like, I don't even know how to like before Instagram implemented music on 
reels and stuff like that. Like I never even knew how to put music onto my own videos for an Instagram. <laughs> I didn't yeah. care because I'm like, I make real videos. I'm gonna you know, I don't yeah. even know all that shit. So it's like nowadays <laughs> there's people that are more qualified and, and better at creating Instagram and social modern day content than me. And yeah. everyone's got a camera in their pocket. So like there is no excuse for real. to not be productive. Like you could self film insane shit and fucking crop and zoom and track and like you yep. know Dak does it all the time i see dak post some sick clips where he just set up his camera and just do a little crop and zoom yeah. and, whatever and throw some motion to it and you're like cool it's 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 got some life to it now it's not this is the crop. new the new computer then it's also it's the camera it's the editing software it's everything built in and yeah like kyle hart i think does a good job of it too the self-film where you crop in after and do i've never fucked with that i know there's an app made for it where you can zoom and keyframe where you want it to be yep. and blah 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 but kids are getting good dude like they don't even understand what adobe premiere pro is they just know how to use splice or cap cut or whatever the fuck and for sure make their videos all right another question i always ask is um tell me you know three or four riders that i don't know about that i should know about i know you don't have your finger on the pulse maybe tell me mountain bikers that i should follow um, besides brandon seminuk because he's 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 already up there yeah um i mean it's tough because there's so many different riders in the space doing different things um i don't know i can't help but just like pick some of my favorites like i mean yeah, our, tell dog, me. our dog his name's ryan howard i consider him like the chase hawk of of mountain biking he's like the dude that like any rider wishes they rode like him okay. and um, i think he is a, a very great ambassador of of the sport and everything that is mountain biking from digging to riding to style and, and lifestyle and everything i'd put him high on that list following him now okay yep. and then um another one is thomas janon uh he is uh from belgium lives in france good friend of mine like highly successful in slope style as well as rampage and like he rides all the bikes he's very often noted to have uh mike aiken style on his like oppo 360 like moto one footers he's got like he's very, fucking sick very dude, stylish but also that. like can do cash rolls and like all the other shits so, like he's a perfect example of like ticking all the boxes um kind of like dennis you know he could do it all video park compete whatever yeah Man, mountain biking is a whole different world. I've never, this is so cool. Let me see a couple more. For sure. Um, yeah. Another one would be, um, fuck, probably Nico Vink. He's a very influential dude, rode BMX as a kid. He used to uh, like ride mini ramps with Hanu Cools back in the day, uh, also from, from Belgium. He's known nowadays for building some of the biggest or the biggest mountain bike jumps ever and riding them in a comfortable like safe like way you know not just like hucking and building some like uncalculated shit um he's really pushing the sport in a new direction with uh big bikes and big jumps and, and what's possible and and how you can do it like stuff that people used to do as like a one-off stunt he's now building whole lines that are of that size and like Damn, taking a dude. train of like 20 dudes through it so yeah he's yeah. fucking amazing yeah. that is yeah. sick he's dude. like you know went from being like bmx dude to downhill racer to a free rider so <clears> three love like very different dudes that i think are all contributing a lot of uh of awesomeness to the the sport but fuck yeah that's perfect thank you I'll, now uh, now i get a little window into mountain biking um for sure. but for bmx if i had to rattle off a couple quick ones i'd say cole volker been yep. really stoked on on what cole's been doing um fuck he's definitely been been a standout that i keep seeing stuff from um yeah i don't know it's i'm like i i like i know the people by like their riding but i'm not so good with names but yeah there's a lot of dudes um fuck i can't even keep up nowadays but cole has definitely been one that i've noticed i'm like cool it's sick to see that like he's just got his own thing going and even if he didn't have that last name he would be mm -hmm. successful in, in what he's doing he's dope He's incredible. Okay. Um, favorite video part that you've, um, one filmed and then two ridden or road biked in. <laughs> um, it's hard for me to not pick 
uh dennis's last chance part okay um, yeah we got to use like whatever fucking music we wanted we filmed for a long time we went to some very amazing one-of-a-kind spots um i remember like editing the part and like needing like one more like really fast like fucking pedaling trick and just telling dennis and showing him the inch like dude like got these four clips we just need one more like fuck yeah let's go get it you know like just we had all the pieces to the puzzle for that like yeah i used music that you would never in your life be able to use anymore or like get yeah. or anything so and that like yeah he won nora cup from it and i think like obviously he's dropped some very um historic parts since then but i think like for that era of time and the shit that he did some shit in that video that i don't even know if he would do nowadays so like i feel Same. like that's like a, a telltale sign that like that was something something special that's a good choice and then and what about uh, you writing for me writing it's got to be my united part that was like the one where um market part was i'm really proud of but that was more road trippy and like kind of came across some random stuff but united was much more meticulous in the sense of like <laughs> definitely did a lot of trips but i i seeked out uh, a lot of setups that i'd been looking at forever or like just some shit that like I never would have found again that I was able to get for that part. Um, yeah. How long did it take to work on that part? I think that was a two year, two year project. And a lot of my footage was with my homies that I filmed. Like Peter Adam was the filmer, but Love like Peter. on the trips, like I definitely get some good stuff. I'm stoked on on the trips, but like, I mean, you're on a trip with up to eight, six to eight other dudes. Like it's yeah. hard to really get it in um so shout out to pete for being cool with me like getting a lot of footage with like even the banger and a bunch of stuff like a lot of my part was filmed with my friends but that was what gave me the means to like really go in and like get the shit i wanted and yeah like i'm i look back at that and i'm like cool like i look at the setups i did and like i'd be hard pressed to find a bigger or better setup of a lot of the stuff that i did and that's how i always did my riding like if I ice picked a 20 stair in my last part, I got to do a 22 or more in the next yeah. one. Never trying to like one down anything. Yeah. So I feel like I, I genuinely like peaked out at that part. And I always told myself if I try and film another one, I'm probably going to really break myself off because I already like dabbled with the limits of what was physically possible for me um, yeah. with a lot of those clips. And I, I rolled the dice and I definitely got hurt a lot, but I, yeah, I think like that was the the best of of my best for that that time of my life. Fuck yeah, that's still united, right? Still united, correct? Yeah. <clears throat> um. All right, and then the last thing is advice. I think yeah, just general advice for young kids who are I don't know, maybe they've been riding for a couple of years and they're just getting a taste of what it's like. I don't know. They're hungry. Maybe they're not sponsored. I don't know. What's what's your advice to a young young BMX rider at this point? I mean, honestly, like it's hard to say one specific thing, but when I look back to like everything that I experienced in my time, like the things that stand out and seem the most important to me were like just my riding group, like my core group of friends, like you know, like you could go anywhere with the right people and have a great time. So if you like have that crew, you could be at the best spot in the world. You could be at the worst spot in the world and you're still going to have a great time. And yeah, I'd say like, just surround yourself with the people that you want to be around and um, take motivation from the people that are doing what you want to do and, and use that to try and get there. Like, perfect. I don't know. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of influences out there and nowadays it's easier than ever to, to reach out, to connect, to like have a connection with these people that when I was younger were like up on this pedestal that like you could like maybe write a letter to ride BMX and maybe like Fudger would like yeah. read it to a pro or something like that. But nowadays like you could straight DM fucking Taj Mahalich and talk to him, you know, like not to yeah. say every pro on the internet's gonna, you know, have the time or see the message or whatever. But I think like we live in a very unique day and age where like I was never afraid to ask a filmer or a writer a question if I had one. And I try and do that same thing, pay that same favor back. You know, like I feel like everything that we've learned and accomplished in our lives is wasted if we can't share that experience with somebody else. So, Fuck yeah. 
uh, anything I can do to to share the knowledge or, or share the experience and get people stoked on this very unique lifestyle that, that we get to live if if you ride bikes is yeah that's the dream so more than happy the dream. to do that and don't be afraid to to reach out and ask some questions or, or get some motivation from someone that you're stoked on yeah hit christian up start bothering him ask him questions yeah. what are hit you most up. excited about that's coming up on the horizon for you other i know you mentioned you got a demo part a cory part coming out but what about for you what are you most excited about in the future um i've got two video parts done already uh, mountain bike parts one on a trail that i built it took me two years to build another is a pretty cool unique street uh concept video and then um oh, I've built the I'm third excited. one i'm about to shoot the third video so i'm stoked to like be like four months into the new year and have three full like video parts on deck and then yeah now i haven't even like dove into like the the means that i have to make more projects this year so i'm trying to just keep the ball rolling and be like ahead of the curve now instead of like last year i had a couple injuries i switched a couple sponsors so i wasn't as like productive and putting out as much uh stuff as i want but yeah i'm like stoked on where i'm at going into this new year i broke my collarbone before christmas i'm all good now feeling feeling good on the bike so Hell yeah, yeah. Stoked to keep riding and keep working on cool projects and do some traveling and Try and keep the dream alive. Happy for you, dude. What are you going to do the rest of today? Um, I'm going to keep moving my house. I, I live over by the beach in Aptos now, and I just had an amazing opportunity to move into a, my own house on a 100-acre property. That's Sheesh. Got three mountain bike trails already on the property. And like I said, the, the trail that started it all for me is literally across the road from where I live. Fuck off. That's so dope. So, this is the closest I'll have to living in what I hope to buy one day. I want to buy land. I want to have a house on the property and I want to have all the property in the world to build all my projects and all my trails. So right now I I'm renting that and I have it all and I'm very stoked and I couldn't be happier to stay in this place while I work towards buying what I'm pretty much what I'm living in now one day. So that's, that's the goal. <laughs> Good for you, dude. Um, I hope this recording doesn't stop okay cool uh and then last thing do you want to shout out your sponsors <laughs> that's silly goofy thing but if you want to before we wrap i mean i'll shout out some people on this <clears throat> as well like i definitely owe a huge thanks to dennis anderson uh mark losi brian castillo ian morris um all and john pova all very uh influential and crucial people to my bmx careers and then um yeah as far as mountain biking goes like brandon seminick for for sure starting it all off for me uh kyle jameson our dog nico vink and then all my sponsors that let me live the the dream that i do so it's specialized uh sram rock shocks uh 510 and fox so Fuck yeah christian good for you dude, dude i'm so happy you. for you I appreciate it, man. It's, yeah, it's, a, like I said, it's a, a dream come true that I never would have even dreamed because it didn't even seem possible in the realm of anything that I could accomplish. I just got stoked on riding bikes and I'm I'm grateful it turned into something. But another thing too, for kids, like everyone always asks like, Oh, like what's some advice? Like I both of my careers, I'm well, three of them. I'm three careers in now. I never had these like aspirations of being a pro of, pro rider, a pro filmer, a pro mountain biker. I just genuinely loved it. Yeah. I stuck with it. I kept going with it and it turned into a career, but I was never, never hungry in the sense of like, I want to make it as a pro. I want to like be where these guys are at. So if you love something pour just your heart into it. it. And if you have the right intentions, which I'm sure you do, if you really love something, then it's all going to work out. Boom. Fuck yeah. All right. Let's wrap it up, Christian. Thank you. Yeah. Cheers, dude. Cheers guys. Adios. Thank you for watching another episode of Canode Knows brought to you by Dig BMX. Hope you enjoyed that one, and I hope you have a great week. See you, uh, yeah, see you next time. Have a good day.